Good morning. I'm Councilmember Margaret Chen, Chair of the Committee on Aging. Thank you all for joining us today for our oversight hearing held jointly with the Committee on Mental Health, Disability, and Addiction. Today we are opening up an important conversation on emotional and mental wellness in older adults, a topic that holds such enormous weight in this community, but is too often overlooked and undetect underdetected. I want to thank Chair Ayala for co-chairing this hearing and demonstrating such fierce commitment to our city seniors' well-being. When it comes to the topic of mental and emotional wellness, older adults face their own unique challenges. These challenges can include coping with illness and physical decline, the loss of loved ones, adapting to a new lifestyle after retirement, or even the loss of a job. Together, these factors increase the risk for older adults to struggle with mental stressors and feelings of sadness, anxiety, and stress. And stress. Unfortunately, many of them do not have anyone to turn to during these difficult times. Various research shows that social isolation and loneliness have a huge adverse impact on the physical and mental well-being of seniors. And according to the United Neighborhood Houses, New York City has a greater percentage of seniors living alone than the entire country. Furthermore, older adults face an increasing array of mental health challenges. Because of their advanced age and life experience, this population may face depression, anxiety, substance and prescription drug abuse and addiction, post-traumatic stress disorder, and even scarier, increasing rates of suicide. When it comes to investing in the mental healthness of our seniors and breaking down the roadblocks to affordable, compassionate, and culturally competent mental health care, the stakes have never been higher. This is why it is so vital that the Department for the Aging, also known as DIFTA, and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, also known as DOHMH, make every effort to ensure that our seniors understand that they do not have to suffer in silence or alone. And it is just as urgent that both agencies coordinate strategically to provide effective mental health services that are easily accessible and reach all seniors, especially the most vulnerable ones. In December 2016, as part of the Thry NYC, DIFTA launched the Geriatric Mental Health Initiative to make mental health services more accessible for older adults at 25 senior centers. Under this initiative, Mental health clinicians evaluate older adults with depression, provide them with relevant referral, and offer on-site counseling. Additionally, under Thrive NYC, the administration expanded DIFTA's older adult visiting programs with the launch of the Friendly Visiting Program. This program provides much needed visiting services to the older adults who live alone and are prone to social isolation. The Friendly Visiting Program seeks to connect clients who are identified by their visitors to need mental health services to appropriate services. DIFTA also operates programs that support vulnerable groups such as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, LGBT, older adults, and older adults grappling with a history of abuse. Research shows that LGBT older adults are among the most at-risk population for isolation and that they are more likely than their heterosexual peers to rely on service providers for help. Over the years, we have seen the city take huge strides in addressing the unique needs of this group. DIFTA sponsored the nation's first senior center focus on LGBT older adults. DIFTA also provides training for senior centers 
case management, and naturally occurring retirement community staff to work with LGBT seniors. In partnership with the Well Cornell Medical Center, DIFTA offers the providing options to elderly clients together, PROTECT program, which help victims of abuse improve their mental wellness. Today's hearing will provide an opportunity for DIFTA and DOHMH to speak more about its current mental health programs and a chance for the advocates program providers and constituents to share their concerns and recommendation on how we can strengthen senior mental health care and programming. Our committee seeks to learn more about what programs are out there, how these programs work, who is accessing them, and how to get more seniors connected to these services. Finally, the committee will also be hearing intro 1180, which I am proud to co-sponsor with Council Member Ayala. This important legislation would require caseworkers providing services in DIFTA senior centers to be trained in DOHMH mental health first aid course for older adults. For too many seniors, especially immigrant seniors, not only have to struggle with lack of access to health care, but are discouraged from coming forward with the mental health challenges due to cultural stigma and shame. Together, we can break the stigma around mental health and craft a new narrative that prioritizes mental health care services for our seniors. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their help in putting together this hearing, our council, Newsart, Todari, policy analyst Kalima Johnson, finance analyst Daniel Koop, and my legislative director, Mariam Gira. Lastly, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank DIFTA Commissioner Donna Corrado for being here with us today. You know, after serving nearly five years at DIFTA as our commissioner, this will be her last hearing. The work that we do requires strong allies and every level of government to lead the charge in their respective spaces to fight to give seniors the support they deserve. Under Commissioner Corrado's leadership, we have strengthened and grown the citywide movement to ensure that every single older adult has a real opportunity to age in place in the neighborhoods they have helped to build. Over the years, the city has secured a historic increase in permanent funding for DIFTA services and expanded the senior service network across our city. Donna, we wanted to thank you as our commissioner for standing with us every step of the way. And it was a pleasure working with you, um, even though sometimes you know, it's hard to fight OMB. <laughs> but we were able to secure historic funding in the year of the senior. And I wish you all the best in your new adventure. But uh, I hope that you'll keep in touch. All right? And now I'd like to uh, turn the floor. Oh. I, I would like to say that um, it's kind of bittersweet in my last uh, testimony here. But this is um, always has been one of the highlights of my commissionership is coming to these hearings and working with you and, and bantering back and forth because I always knew that whatever we do, we do it for a common purpose and that's to make lives better for our older New Yorkers. And I thank you for the work that you do. And I know, and I would be remiss to say, it hasn't necessarily always been easy, but it's always been a privilege. And I thank you for all you do. And no, I'm not going too far, so it's not goodbye. But thank you for those lovely remarks. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, now I'd like to uh, turn the floor over to my co-chair, Councilmember Ayala, for some opening remark and to speak on her bill. Thank you, Chair uh, Chen. I will try to read this. I need some bifocal, so please bear with me. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm Councilmember Diana Ayala, Chair of the Committee of Mental Health, Disabilities, Addiction, and I would like to thank all of you for being here. 
According to the New York City Department for the Aging, New York City's older adult population includes 1.5 million people over the age of 60. While many of these individuals lead happy, healthy, and active lives, over the past 10 years, New York City has seen an increase in the number of older adults who are poor and living alone. Both of these factors serve, as an inc uh, serve to increase the severity of mental illness in this population. The Geriatric Mental Health Alliance of New York has predicted that over the next 25 years, the number of older adults with mental illness in the U.S. will double from 7 to 14 million, including an increase of more than 50 percent in New York State alone, from 500,000 to 780,000 individuals. Today, we hope to examine and learn more about existing programs that help to uh, serve to support mental wellness in older adults in New York City. Additionally, we seek to identify gaps in services so that we, we may be able to provide additional support to those who need them the most. It is our belief that by eliminating barriers to service and providing support and training to caregivers and advocates of this population, uh, New York's older adults will be able to flourish and enjoy a happy, healthy, and quality of life. We look forward to hearing from all of the stakeholders here today in order to work towards building a better mental health system for older adults that are holistic, comprehensive, culturally competent, and accessible for all. I would like to thank my committee staff, Council Sarah List, Policy Analyst Christy Dwyer, Finance, Finance Analyst Jeanette Morrow, my Chief of Staff Millie Bonilla, my Legislative Director Bianca Almedina for making this hearing possible. Thank you. Thank you. And we've been joined by Council Member Drum and Council Member Holden. And now, in accordance with the rules of the Council, uh, the Council will now administer the affirmation to the witnesses from the mayor administration. Uh, can you please identify yourself and then, I guess, the first panel? Oh, okay. I'm Donna Carrado. Should I start? Identify yourself. Myla Harrison, Assistant Commissioner with the Bureau of uh, Mental Health in the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Hi, I'm uh, ja uh, Jackie Berman. I'm Deputy Assistant Commissioner over uh, research and part of the Thrive Initiatives. I'm Toby Abramson. I'm the Director of Geriatric Mental Health at the Department for the Aging. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, before these committees, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Okay. Good morning, Chairperson Chin, Ayala, Drum, and Holder, and members of the Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction Committees. I am Donna Carrado, Commissioner of the New York City Department for the Aging, and from DIP. DIFTA, I'm joined by Dr. Jackie Berman, who's Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Research, and Dr. Toby Abramson, Director of the Geriatric Mental Health Program. I'm also joined on my right by Dr. Myla Harrison, Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of Mental Hygiene of the City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I would like to thank you for this opportunity to testify on the topic of mental wellness in older adults as well as intro 1180 in relation to mental health first aid training for senior center caseworkers. DOHMH will provide testimony on intro 1180. According to the American Psychological Association, prevalence estimates suggest that approximately 20% of older adults throughout the U.S. meet the criteria for a mental disorder. And in New York State, that number is expected to increase by more than 50% by 2030. Accurate prevalence rates are difficult to determine as many older adults are not diagnosed or are misdiagnosed or do not seek treatment. Older adults have high rates of late onset mental health disorders and low rates of identification and treatment. Mental illness and aging are often a double stigma that older adults face. There is a growing need for the provision of mental health services for older adults. Stigma surrounding mental illness and inability to recognize mental health issues and a lack of available services and providers continue to impede accessibility to needed mental health services for older New Yorkers. In light of the demand for geriatric mental health programs, the Department for the Aging has engaged in various initiatives throughout the years focusing on education 
for both staff and older adults, as well as screenings and referrals for mental health services. Some of these efforts and initiatives include um, DIFTA and DOMH, DOHMH co-sponsored call EASD, E-A-S apostrophe D, and this is an evidence-based program where workshops on depression were conducted within DIFTA-sponsored senior centers. Depression screenings and follow-up were done to assist with connections to care. To maximize sustainability, a train-the-trainer approach was developed so that staff learned how to facilitate workshops about depression on their own and how to conduct screenings and follow-up. In addition to senior centers, the depression workshops were facilitated over the phone for homebound older adults through our contracted case management agencies. Follow-up calls were made to the homebound clients to screen them for depression and make referrals for services. Another initiative was called SMART-MH, and it stands for Sandy Mobilization Assessment Referral and Treatment for Mental Health. Through the SMART-MH program, approximately 2,000 older adults living in areas devastated by Hurricane Sandy were comprehensively assessed for mental health needs, including depression, suicide risk, anxiety, and alcohol misuse. Individuals in need of services receive the evidence-based treatment engage from licensed counselors at a senior centers, NORCs, and where necessary in their home. Smart MH services were provided in Spanish, Russian, Mandarin, Cantonese, and English. Another program at our NORCs was the NORC Health Plus program, and we've created to was created to provide older adults who are aging in place with educational interventions aimed at improving their ability to self-manage their physical and mental health needs. Four of our NORC programs located in Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Queens are participating in this initiative. The goals of NHP, the NORC Health Program Plus, include encouraging the implementation of two evidence-based programs within the NORC communities, the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program and the mental health intervention called behavioral activation. Case assistance staff within the four NORC programs were trained to identify seniors with depression and to implement behavioral activation, which is a short-term technique that has shown to reduce depression among older adults. Mental health services for DIFTA's long-term care clients included an assessment process for case management, elder abuse, and elderly crime victim resource center programs. And our clients are screened for depression, homebound older adults within DIFTA's case management network in need of mental health interve interventions receive referrals for in-home services provided by Wild Cornell Medical Center clinicians. Services include a range of both evidence-based short-term and long-term interventions. In addition, the services are available in Spanish and English. In-service trainings on mental health are provided to case management staff through Wild Cornell Medical Center, which they're tailored to meet the needs of the individual providers, the provider agencies. As you mentioned, um, Council Member Chin, DIFTA also conducts what we call PROTECT, which is an evidence-based program. With one in 10 older adults experiencing elder abuse, rates of anxiety and depression, depressive symptoms are high among this vulnerable population. Elder abuse victims suf suffering from anxiety and depression may face even more obstacles in taking the necessary steps to protect themselves and obtain assistance. To address this, DIFTA partnered with Wild Cornell Medical Center to develop a program, PROTECT, a mental health program to be integrated into their elder abuse agencies. The program combines training to conduct routine screening for mental health concerns and integration of a brief psychotherapy by a mental health clinician. The problem-solving psychotherapy is offered in conjunction with elder abuse services, and depending on the needs of the clients, cli services are provided in the community, in the victim's home, or in the office. While Cornell also provides in-service trainings on mental health to elder abuse program staff, and as you know, we have a full network of elder abuse programs in every borough. DIFTA has provided various trainings on older adult 
mental health to hundreds of participants throughout the years. Topics include depression, alcohol abuse, anxiety, dementia, suicide prevention, and elder abuse. DIFTA is also planning an upcoming coming training on trauma-informed care for elder abuse service staff. In partnership with DOHMH, DIFTA conducts mental health first aid trainings. Mental health first aid is an evidence-based training program designed to equip non-mental health professionals with the knowledge needed to identify potential mental health issues among clients so that they can be linked to services. DOHMH has trained four DIFTA staff in this technique, and in turn, the DIFTA staff provide mental health first aid training to its case managers, senior center staff, and to volunteers. To date, 400 individuals within DIFTA network have received mental health first aid training. In 2015, Mayor de Blasio and First Lady McRae released Thrive New York City, a mental health roadmap for all. Thrive New York City is a plan of action to guide the city toward a more effective and holistic system to support the mental well-being of New Yorkers. Two Thrive New York City initiatives focused on geriatric mental health and are led by the Department for the Aging. One initiative embeds mental health practitioners in 25 senior centers across the city, and the second initiative combats social isolation among homebound older adults. Through DIFTA's Geriatric Mental Health Initiative, mental health services are available on site at 25 of the largest senior centers in the agency's network. Mental health professionals assist older adults with issues ranging from depression and anxiety to highly disruptive behaviors. DIFTA contracts with four mental health provider agencies covering all five boroughs. JASA is the provider organization for clinical services at four centers in the Bronx, SPOP is the provider for six Manhattan senior centers, including Mott Street Senior Center and the Weinberg Center for Balanced Living. Samuel Fields Cape provides services at six Queens locations, including Sunnyside Senior Center and Peter Cardella Senior Center. While Cornell covers eight senior centers in Brooklyn and one senior center in Staten Island. Two of the Brooklyn sites are the J. Harama Senior Center and Coney Island Seaside Innovative Senior Center. Individuals do not need to be a senior center member, but must be over the age of 60 to receive mental health services at these locations. To destigmatize mental health among these populations, clinicians conduct structured engagement activities, such as formal presentations and unstructured activities, such as informal conversations at each of these sites. The clinicians conduct mental health assessments as well as provide support and ongoing individual, group, family, and couples psychotherapy to older adults and their families. Mental health services are provided by bilingual and mostly bicultural social workers who are fluent in major languages spoken at the center. In addition to English, the languages spoken include Cantonese, Italian, Mandarin, Polish, Russian, Spanish, and Ukrainian. The clinicians work with both internal and external support services to make referrals to social services and other mental health services as needed. Through DGMH, nearly 1,500 older adults were screened for mental health needs, and more than 17,500 older adults participated in structured engagement activities, and approximately 40,000 have been in contact with on-site clinicians. The Friendly Visiting Program focuses on isolated, largely homebound seniors who are served through DIFTA's 21 contracted case management agencies covering all 59 community districts. The program was designed to connect seniors facing the negative effects of social isolation with well-trained volunteers who spend time with them in order to provide social interaction. As a result, Friendly Visiting Services as a mental health intervention program the program model expands the older adult's connection to their community and may prevent the isolated senior from declining into depression and loneliness. Additionally, all friendly visiting program coordinators have received mental health first aid training. These coordinators have learned how to recognize possible behavioral health issues so that older adults in need can be immediately referred <clears throat> to their case manager and linked to appropriate services. 
The program coordinators recruit friendly visitors who are matched with a homebound older adult. Friendly visitors then visit the senior at least two times per month. Any changes in functioning, including identified mental health issues, are referred to the case management agency for appropriate referrals and follow-up. Since the program's inception just a few short years ago, volunteers have made more than 17,170 visits to older adults in their homes and have spent a total of 27,200 hours with seniors. Thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony on the various DIFTA programs that address mental wellness in older adults. And following testimony from my colleagues from DOMH, I, will, I am pleased to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Good morning, Chairs Chin and Ayala and members of the committees, Drum and Holden. I'm Dr. Myla Harrison, Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of Mental Health at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. On behalf of the Acting Commissioner Barbeau, thank you for the opportunity to testify on mental health for older New Yorkers. Older adults face unique challenges that impact their mental wellness. Physical health conditions, living on a fixed income, loss of loved ones, increased risk for social isolation, and unstable housing all impact the overall health of individuals and the ability to receive proper mental health care. Social isolation is one of particular concern for older adults as it can lead to declines in physical, mental, and cognitive health. The most common behavioral and neurological disorders among those 65 and older are depression and dementia, but anxiety, psychosis, and substance use disorder are also prevalent. In 2017, 11% of adults aged 45 to 64 and 9% of adults over 65 reported symptoms of depression. Depression is even more prevalent among older new adults who are homebound or who have chronic physical health conditions such as heart disease, stroke, cancer, lung disease, arthritis, dementia, and neurodegenerative disorders. Older adults also have high rates of suicide than younger populations. In 2015, New York City suicide rates were highest among men over 65 at 15.5 per 100,000 people. Furthermore, older adults most often seek mental health care through their primary care provider rather than mental health providers. Mental health services are often not well integrated into primary care, which leads to missed prevention and treatment opportunities. To address this concern, the health department is increasing access to mental health care by reaching older adults where they access care, promoting awareness of mental health concerns in the community, and working with communities to ensure cultural and linguistic competency of the services we provide. Examples of this work include the Mental Health Service Corps Initiative has placed early career behavioral health clinicians in 224 practices throughout the city, including 134 primary care practices and 90 behavioral health practices. Given the diversity of the city, we are matching bilingual clinicians to practices that request certain languages wherever possible. Since 2017, our program to encourage active and rewarding lives for seniors, or PEARLS, has worked throughout the five boroughs and has screened 8,770 homebound older adults for depression. Of these, 638 individuals with depression have completed treatment with PEARLS. Over 16% of residents in the over 8,000 supportive housing units that DOHMH oversees are age 65 and older and are aging in place. This provides an important opportunity to provide supports for individuals and families in permanent housing who have a mental illness and or substance use disorder. To increase depression screening in primary care settings, the health department is conducting public health detailing campaigns comprised of one-on-one -on -one visits to provide, sorry, comprised of one-on-one -on -one visits with more than 160 primary care practices in East and Central Harlem, North and Central Brooklyn, and the South Bronx to help educate providers to integrate depression screening and treatment into routine primary care. Throughout the City Council, through the City Council Geriatric Mental Health Initiative, we support 22 community-based organizations that serve older adults in improving their capacity to identify depression and alcohol and substance use disorders and connect those in need with support and treatment services. 
for older adults with serious mental illness whose needs have not been met by traditional outpatient mental health services, the Bronx-based geriatric assertive community treatment team delivers comprehensive and flexible treatment, support, and rehabilitation services to individuals in the community. And as always, older adults, their caregivers and providers can contact NYC Well for connection to mental health resources and support. From the start of the program in 2016, 7.7% of callers identified that they were over the age of 60. NYC Well can be accessed in over 200 languages and counselors match clients to services that meet the individual's cultural needs. I will now turn to the bill being heard today, Intro 1180. Mental Health First Aid is an evidence-based curriculum that teaches participants how to recognize the signs and symptoms of mental illness and substance misuse. The curriculum, licensed by the National Council on Behavioral Health, also provides trainees with the skills to respond when someone close to them is experiencing a mental health or substance use crisis. The training is free for New Yorkers and is offered six days a week in all five boroughs and available in multiple languages. As part of Thrive NYC, the administration has committed to train 250,000 New Yorkers by 2021. This is a massive and unprecedented effort to provide New Yorkers with the skills needed to identify, understand, and respond to signs of mental health challenges, including anxiety, depression, psychosis, suicidal behavior, overdose, and withdrawal. The administration shares the council's goal of training all frontline staff to recognize mental health issues, and we look forward to discussing with the council the best ways to accomplish that goal in the long term. As part of the administration's 2021 training goal, the health department has prioritized training frontline city workers and social service providers that interact with the public. Our dedicated team of 39 trainers work with 15 outreach staff to deliver over 60 all-day trainings each week. To date, we have trained over 41,000 city staff and service providers in mental health for state across 14 city agencies and are working to reach many more. In collaboration with the Department for the Aging, we're delivering mental health first aid module that focuses on older adults. So far, we have trained over 400 staff, providers, and older adults at Department for the Aging run senior centers and aim to reach a total of 1,000 frontline and service provider staff. This training supplements the more intensive training in specific behavioral health issues that the Department for the Aging provides its staff and providers. I want to thank the Mayor and First Lady for their unprecedented support for improving mental wellness in New York City, and thank you to Chairs Chin and Ayala and the members here today for your partnership and voices. We look forward to our continued collaboration as we improve the health and well-being of older New Yorkers. And we're happy to take your questions. Thank you for your testimony. And we've also been joined by <coughs> Councilmember Vallone and Councilmember Rose. OK. I will uh, start with a couple of questions, and then my colleagues uh, and also Chair Ayala, uh, I'll pass it on. Um, Commissioner, so in your testimony, um, you have listed a lot more uh, program um, that works with um, you know, providing mental health services, which is great. Um, this is also the first time I've heard about some of them. <laughs> Uh, so, how does um, DIFTA reach out um, for mental wellness purposes um, to seniors outside of the senior center? Um, I know that you mentioned something about NORC, but it's only, I think it was only four NORCs in the program. So there are... For that specific intervention, but all of our case managers um, are trained mental health workers to some extent, be just by virtue of the fact that they are licensed social workers and MSW. So we have a certain level of professional um, staff in all of our programs. So we're, you know, I'm not assuming, I know that um, we screen and assess for mental health issues with every senior that we touch in our case management program. We do a, an extensive biopsychosocial assessment, and that's part of their, their regular assessment and their reassessment every six months. So 
that um, you know, we have some degree of confidence that we can identify mental health issues and identify the resources in the community. For example, um, we developed a special program, and I'll, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Jackie Berman to go into greater detail after Superstorm Sandy to address the mental health needs of the general community in South Brooklyn. Um, so that's just one example of how we will also do things as, as needed. And, and I can remember, and not necessarily DIFTA initiated, but sometimes our sponsoring agencies also do mental health services and they work and integrate programs within their own settlement houses, for example, in terms of crisis intervention, if there's something happening, if there's a, um, a natural disaster, or if there's something we've we routinely did in our senior centers when, when a long-term senior center member passed away, we would do bereavement groups and things like that. So we're pretty nimble in terms of the addressing mental health needs um, of our senior center members. So that's case management senior center members and then addressing um, on an ad hoc basis whatever the community needs at that given moment. But there's, there's generally, um, and I can say this with great confidence, our senior centers have connections with mental health providers in their community and they work with their, their hospitals, with psychiatric nurses, and other mental health programs. And of course, they always have at the ready through the connections that we have at the Department for the Aging and our connections with the Department of Health, we try to get them what they need. Yeah, I, yeah, in my, in my district, I mean, just this year, there were two suicide, two senior killed themselves mm -hmm. um, in one development. And it really sent a shockwave. And, Fortunately, we had a, a knock in the, mm -hmm. in the development, and uh, Hamilton Madison House, they also provide mental health services, and they were able to come in and, and do a series of workshops uh, for the seniors living in, in the building, and it's, it's really very, very needed and helpful. It's just that we're looking at you know, all these programs, um, and when you talk about case management, that touches seniors mainly who are homebound. And that's why in, in the legislation, uh, 1180, we're looking at to make sure that every senior center have that capacity. And right now, I don't think every senior center, you know, have a trained social worker, or even if they do, in terms of the capacity. I mean, you have a few hundred seniors uh, if you have one social worker, you're not going to be able to sort of um, take care of all of them. And one thing I really wanted to hear also was that, have you heard from some of the senior center in terms of some of the best practice, especially in combating the stigma and being culturally competent to really deal with the specific culture and how to get the senior to, to sort of come in and, and chat and and in, in that way, to be able to identify what um, services they might need. So I'm going to um, hand the mic over to Dr. Toby Abramson, who's been doing the actual work in the senior centers in terms of engagement, because it's a, a very structured approach and one that we insist on using evidence-based models. Um, to do engagement activities, and we've done an extensive amount of work. And I, you know, while people have rapport with seniors in a senior center, and many of our um, senior center directors and staff are very competent, we want this program to go above and beyond that and really do evidence-based interventions so that we know at the end of it that it's, um, it's effective. So with that. Thank you, Commissioner. So engagement's been a very central part of engaging older adults in mental health services. We know it's very important to destigmatize mental health. And by embedding a social worker several days a week on site in the center, two things happen. We can do structured, very formal presentations. We can engage them in DIFTA's development of HTASTIC, which is a health promotion program, which touches on all different areas of physical and mental health functioning. We have structured activities that can range from talks on 
decluttering. We, we're very careful not to call it hoarding. Um, we have programs that really meet the need of the senior center. Topics are generated in combination by myself, the clinician, as well as the senior center staff. What resonates in a particular center? So we don't just say this is the, the topic every senior center clinician will talk about. So we really try to meet the need of the center. So we have those very formal structured engagement activities which have been hugely successful, not only because the people who actually physically sit in a space, but everybody else around in the center hears, touches on it, sees the clinician in action. And one of the things that I think has been really effective is the unstructured, that informal engagement activities, where the clinician may go and sit and have a cup of coffee with somebody or a cup of tea, because we know what happens when you sit down at a table with somebody, you start to talk. And, or the senior center staff may pinpoint and say, you know, I'm really concerned about so-and-so. Can you have lunch with them today? And through that informal networking and conversation, the clinician has the ability to identify what's happening, what they can offer, and say, would you like to move this into my office where we can continue to talk more privately? So we really engage them in where the senior is at based on starting with some formal conversations. So this time of year, we may start talking around holiday blues. Um, we come up with topics that resonate. So for example, in our Polish community, we may not do a one-time or one-off topic. We may do a three-part series. And we put it in a name that sounds comfortable to the center. So for that group, we're talking about where do you find a good pierogi in New York City? And what that does is it allows them to talk about acculturation, the differences with family members, the stresses and strains that come when you are from a different generation than your children, and so it opens up. Within the, um, our Chinese communities, both in the Mandarin and Cantonese-speaking communities, we have found that problem-solving very concrete approaches to engagement through HTASTIC, through other types of uh, clinical sessions have been really helpful in generating, um, in destigmatizing the mental health and engaging them. And we have had huge successes with our bilingual, bicultural clinicians in engagement and then transferring them over to um, mental health services. We have, of the people we've identified with mental health services, 54% have a mental health need. And of those, we've had a 76% connection rate into clinical services. And we really are starting to look deeply at the value and of, of engagement, because I think without that, our success numbers would not have been, or would not be as great. So in, is that services available? You do that to all your senior centers? That is part of the model. And what's unique about it than a mental health clinic just going in and doing mental health services is through the Thrive NYC support, we're able to support the clinician taking the time to do engagement. We feel that's such a very valuable part that we emphasize that once the clinician is really embedded in clinical services, we encourage them still once a week to do some type of engagement. And if they're really busy, then we scale it back a little bit. But that's always an ongoing part of the the process, so every center has engagement activities that are happening every time the clinician walks in the door. But in the, with the Thai NYC program uh, initiative, you only have uh, that service in 25 senior centers. Yes, actually I was gonna clarify. So, um, so that is available in the 25 senior centers that are funded under the Thrive NYC initiative. Howsoever, as the commissioner pointed out, Every older adult in anywhere in the community um, are encouraged and free to come and attend any of those programs. You don't even have to be a member of a senior center um, to avail yourself of those activities and services. So is there any plan to expand the, the Thrive NYC program to other senior centers? Because that's a more in-depth program, right? So it's the 25 centers um, that we're basically um, housed in, and we also serve neighboring centers. So that's the 25 centers, and then we have outreach to um, nearby centers. So it's, it's many more than the 25. And um, 
it's the initial stages of Thrive New York City, and I think we've made a tremendous accomplishment in the last couple of years. It's, it's a very involved process in terms of um, making that relationship with a formal aging service provider and a mental health provider that also has an Article 31 clinic and establishing a satellite program. There's a process involved in that, and it's quite lengthy and cumbersome, although to the, the credit of um, DOHMH, we've uh, streamlined that process considerably. Uh, it's taken a long time. So we're in the process of assessing what that next iteration looks like. Of course, we'd like to expand in the future, but right now, um, we're getting it up and running and, and having large success, and it's astounding how many lives we've touched. It really is. Also, Commissioner, you list a lot of programs uh, in your testimony. How many of them are still ongoing, and how many of them, has any one of them ended, or they're still ongoing? Um, yes, yeah, so many of the programs that uh, the Commissioner noted are no longer um, uh, being provided. They were um, sort of short-term uh, grant um, programs, but it was to show sort of our long-standing involvement, commit, commitment to mental health services um, within uh, the department. So the services that are currently being provided are the ones under the Thrive NYC initiative that that the commissioner talked about. So all the other program, like the Sandy program, um, right? So the protect the, program, all that is done. No. So the the Smart MH, um, yes, that was a uh, program that was funded mm -hmm. through FEMA, and that is no longer. However, protect um, services for elder abuse victims is currently um, in operation as well as um, providing services for homebound older adults that are connected through our friendly visiting program. So those are two that are still um, uh, uh, in operation in addition to the DIFTA's geriatric mental health program and our senior centers and our friendly visiting program. Okay, I'm gonna pass it on to uh, Chair Ayala to ask some questions, thank you. Do you happen to have a list of which 25 senior centers are selected to provide this service? I do. I have the list here. Would you mm -hmm. like me to read it to you or could yes. provide it to you? I, I think, yeah. So in Brooklyn, um, the main agency is Weill Cornell. That's the mental health provider, and they serve eight sites in Brooklyn, Amico, Barinkin Plaza, Council Center, J. Harama, JCC Coney Island, the Crocus Luncheon Club, Bridgewood Bushwick, and United Neighborhood. Uh, in the Bronx, JASA is the provider, and they serve Bay Eden, Casa Barinqua, Bronx Works, and PSS, that's Presbyterian Senior Services, Davidson Center. Um, in Manhattan, SPOP is the provider, and they serve the Ed Alliance, Weinberg Center, Lenox Hills uh, in ISC, Mott Street Senior Center, Project Find at Hamilton House, and the Riverstone Senior Life, as well as the Center at Red Oak. In Queens, CAPE at the Samuel Field Y is the provider, um, and they serve Theodora Jackson, Self Help Benjamin Rosenthal, the Rego Park Neighborhood Senior Center at Queens Community House, the Sunnyside Community Services, Peter Cardella, and Hannock Harmony, ISC. And in Staten Island, Wild Cornell is the provider, and they service um, the JCC of Staten Island. How were exactly were these 25 senior centers selected as opposed to? That, that's a, a very good question. And we did a great deal of research and groundwork from the very beginning. And I set the criteria um, because I think it's very important that it be some, an aging service provider so that they have expertise in, in geriatric services in general and also that they have a licensed mental health clinic. So that weeded out many of our providers throughout the network, but we have a, a fairly decent subset of providers that fit that criteria. And then from there, we looked at 
capacity issues because it's you know not every senior center for example has private space that they can that lends themselves to counseling a willingness on on the side of the provider to actually accept a new program and, and a new initiative and work with us quite extensively um, and something I think which is um, more anecdotal but certainly I get calls every day from senior center directors that have um, a preponderance of very disturbed senior center members for whatever reason that really changed the culture and the flavor of the senior center and they're crying for help. So it was a combination of those, those things and other criteria that we looked at, but we did a great deal of thought to where those 25 centers would be located and we tried to do an equal distribution as well in, in different areas with different cultural groups. Um, so we came up with 25 and now we're in the process of assessing if we were able to roll out to more centers what that would look like. But it's an involved process and I think um, a quite extensive one. I ask because I, I see I know that in none of the uh, in, in none of the identified senior centers are in, in communities York. that are necessarily impoverished. Um, the South Bronx, for instance, has seen a spike in uh, depression, specifically in older uh, women, and I I don't see anywhere where it's reflected what additional resources have been kind of steered in that so, direction. So so I I. I I can answer that in a question that um, we also looked at where were there currently mental health resources in a community? And mental health, as you know, you know knows no, you know, it, it's, it does not discriminate between a, a wealthier neighborhood or not, or a wealthier person and a poor person. In many of the poorer communities, there are um, m mental health clinics and that are prevalent and very entrenched in the community. So that's not necessarily um, the criteria that we looked at, but certainly we're looking to grow um, the program in the future. So it's, if it's something that you think we should look at and there's a particular subset, um, we'll work with you to try to address that. I mean, I, I think that the data, right, and the DOH, OHMH's uh, own studies reflect that there is a significant need in the Bronx, right? But we're not servicing the entire Bronx. We're servicing primarily the North Bronx. The South Bronx, I mean, I represent the poorest congressional district. Um, 138th Street is practically uh, a naturally occurring, you know, community because of the abundance of senior housing and senior centers that are concentrated in a specific area. And I had difficulty finding a mental health provider um, when we were allocating funding this year uh, for referral-based programming. Um, I wish that we had a SPOP, who I love and I, I think does a, a spectacular job, and I, JASA does a, a great job. I mean, all, they all do. But I, I, I had a very difficult time identifying a provider to, to provide this service for us in the South Bronx. And I, I, don't, I don't understand why, because the data is there. The inf I mean, we know that we need it, um, which makes it more important to train as many caseworkers and individuals that are coming in contact with seniors that are frequenting our senior centers day in and day out. So out of the 400 plus, I believe, was the number of individuals that were trained, how many of those were caseworkers? The, the person that is responsible for doing the intake uh, screening for new members at each senior center? Do you want to answer that? I, I don't have that um, off the top of my head, and I'm not sure if we're tracking to that level, but I, we can go back and, and look into, I mean, quite a few of the people trained were the staff working in the senior centers. Is so, the senior center, is the training mandatory or is it voluntary? Training is voluntary at this point. It's still voluntary. What, what, what part of DIFTA's budget is, is dedicated to mental health? Uh, through the Thrive New York City Mental Health Initiative, it's uh, approximately 1.3 million. Okay. And does DIFTA have staff dedicated specifically for mental health programs in, in response? 
So we do have staff that are dedicated. Dr. Toby Abramson is our Director of Geriatric Mental Health. Um, so she's our, our primary person throughout, and we, uh, we do train existing staff. So they are um, in our case management programs, and they are existing staff, but Toby's been coordinating this effort, and we've done um, a tremendous job and have a tremendous reach, actually, and it's, uh, it's only a couple of years old, so. I could, I could imagine, and I, I appreciate mm -hmm. the, um, the efforts. Um, but when I worked in senior services, we were required every, annually to, um, to go in and do training for CPR, right? Is that still a mandatory requirement for DIFTA? So I have our, our DIFTA Learning Center director here, um, and we have a number of mandatory trainings, both for the city and then for every person that has um, a social work license, as you know, they have a CEU that they, they must get as well, and we try to, we have an extensive curriculum for any new caseworker that comes on and works in a, in a DIFTA program. So between the mandatory DCAS uh, trainings and now this mental health trainings, um, and, and Margaret Reif can attest to, we, we spend an, an extraordinary amount of time training staff and mandatory trainings, you know, every time you turn around, it's another mandatory training. Um, but CPR is mandatory. CPR is, I'm not sure, is it? Senior center staff it is, yes. Exactly, so, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the point, is that we're trying to make the correlation. If CPR, right, and I think that the first lady has been, you know, saying this time and time again, that in the same way that we train for CPR, we should be training individuals um, on for, uh, first uh, aid on mental health. And we're not doing that at the senior center level. And so that's concerning to me because we're not getting to every senior center quickly enough. And so we need to train the trainer basically in this, at this point. Um, I you know, have a multitude of senior centers in my district and we try to, to do senior health uh, first aid uh, training just a few months ago and it was like, it, it, nearly impossible, we actually had to cancel it because we could not get seniors, we were actually specifically targeting um, older adults and individuals that were working with older, the older adult population in the district and nobody, you know, uh, could come to this training. It was not a priority, right? It was not a priority. It's the last thing that we think about. Senior center staff is pretty, you know, I mean, it's, they're underfunded, they're, you know, uh, overworked often and so this is not something that they're necessarily thinking about and so we need to, to make it a part of that conversation. Um, let me see here. Into, okay, so we got to that one. I think, well, actually, you know what? I'm gonna have some of the members have asked some questions and I'll get back. Okay. We also been uh, joined by council member um, Cabrera, Ben Bramer, uh, council member Rodriguez was here earlier and council member April Samuel. I just wanted to, a quick follow up. Um, the Thrive NYC program with the um, 25 uh, Senior Center and Commission, you were talking about 1.3 million. Budget time is coming up again. So, um, has DIFTER interact with uh, the First Lady, Thrive NYC leadership to look at expanding funding uh, so that we can expand this program that is doing so well? It's doing so well, and we've engaged in, in not only conversations uh, with the First Lady and the First Lady staff, but also I think it's, it's very important to do the evaluation piece. So everything, you know, I can say it's wonderful, 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 but we really need um, the evidence to show that the investment is worthwhile. So we've been engaged in that process, and yes, we're always in ongoing conversations with the uh, the First Lady and, and the Thrive New York City staff. What about some of the other program that you have mentioned? Um, are there evaluation done uh, for some of the other initiative that you deal with in mental health that you feel that we should be asking for more 
funding to expand those programs? So a lot of these programs were pilot programs, for example, that we, we engaged with Wild Cornell, and for a, a, a great example is Agetastic, where we worked with the researchers in Wild Cornell and the clinicians, and we developed the evidence to make evidence-based programming. So I think that was an important pilot, and we participated in that, and now we have the evidence. As you know, it's a very long, involved process. Some of it we're, you know, halfway there. Some of it we're all, you know, all the way there. Um, but with that, we're always looking to replicate good programs. So if they pass the, the, the litmus test for an evidence-based program and they're published, we certainly would like to replicate some of those programs. And one of them, a perfect example, um, is Agetastic, and we're now using that in our senior centers and through our Thrive New York City. That becomes the main vehicle, it has become the main vehicle by which we do those engagement activities. And the first lady herself came to a center and and played, I would say, play the game. It's, it's more than a game, but um, she participated in that activity at one of our centers and found it very engaging. You want to add, on, add that? Yeah, I just wanted to, to add to that because the department is often the incubator of some of these um, really exciting evidence-based programs that then, be, then are expanded. For example, with SmartMH, um, where we worked with Hurricane uh, Sandy um, victims, that was, you know, part of, it was incubated and developed as a partnership with Welcome Cornell and the Department for the Aging, and it was part of the springboard as well as some of our other prior initiatives for which um, our uh, DGMH was, was born. Also protect um, the really um, exciting mental health program for elder abuse victims, um, really one of the, the only one in, in the country was developed, again, within the Department for the Aging with our elder abuse staff um, and evaluated, found so successful, and now rolled out into our community. Yeah, I mean, it would be great if you can share some of the results with us and see how we can be helpful in terms of advocating, um, expanding those uh, programs to senior centers and other um, senior service provider in the city. Um, we also been joined by Councilmember Deutsch. Um, Councilmember Malone, for some questions. Thank you to Chair Zael and Chair Chin. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Commissioner, I guess since the official memo went out, let me, let me congratulate you and Thank you. it's been an honor to work with you over the last four or five years with Chair Chin and I have we've been uh, the fighting is, for seniors. <laughs> the feeling is mutual. It has been um, a, a great lesson on one of the best battles we can have as we always fight for our seniors and I think Chair Ayo and Chair Chin have, have hit it right on the head. These, these are topics that we're always trying to learn and grow and I think each one of our districts as always a very unique in the ethnic backgrounds, on the computation, computation of the seniors. We have one of the largest groups of seniors in Queens. Um, the Asian community is, is bursting at the seams at our senior centers. With these programs, and you mentioned some numbers with the total numbers reached in percentages. You had said there was 54% identified, and of that, 75% have been uh, worked with. What, what do they come out to? What do those numbers actually entail? So I could, Toby can address that. So it's of the 1,500 screened, with a, um, 805 have had a positive mental health screen. And the screening occurred where? There, we use 14 different scales. Uh, depression, anxiety, cognitive function are absolutely required on each person. And then we ask the clinicians to do a leading question on all of the other scales, ranging from alcohol use, other substances, hoarding, elder abuse, gambling, psychosis, social isolation, loneliness, caregiver stress, and... No, not the categories, but where, how did the 1,500 members, where were they identified and targeted? Where did they occur? 
where are they coming from? Mm -hmm. They're coming from our senior centers or the communities around the senior centers. The mental health programs that are in the 25 centers are open to everybody in the community. Um, whether you're in a senior center member or not, you just hear about it and you're 60 and over, you can come in for services. So it's based on, as Chair Iola was saying, on those 25 centers alone? There are 25 centers where the clinicians are located, but we're open to everybody. So the 1,500 of the 25 centers, is that the total number of seniors that were identified or total number of the, seniors that they just managed to start the program? Those are the 1,500 were screened. Those are people oh, who are that, willing to come in. That's giving me the same answer. So what, what the, happens is. How many actually applied or actually were identified that could be part of the mental health initiative? It can't be 1,500. It's got to be more than that. So what happens when a clinician is on site, they offer the screening to every senior. Seniors have the ability to say, no, I'm not interested in being assessed. I, I really don't want to sit down with the clinician. So we've had 1,500 people since we've started that are willing to sit down with, this, with the clinician. Are the, are the clinicians, uh, which goes to the heart of part of this also, is are they trained bilingually? Are they trained? Bilingually, or do they have yes, training the clinicians in different languages? actually are bilingual and bicultural. So they speak a variety of different languages. They are embedded in the center that the bilingual bilingual Are they sent clinician. specifically to centers with that language knowledge? Because if you go to Whitestone, they better speak Italian. If they go to Flushing, they better Correct. speak Korean and Chinese. Correct. If gonna, do they have that? Because that is the number yes, one they do. Uh, complaint that we get is that so there's the a languages, lack of... The languages that we provide are English, Spanish, Mandarin, Cantonese, Polish, Russian, uh, Ukraine. And so... Are we planning on hiring more? Because I'm sure we don't have enough. Are we planning on if hiring we, more? That would be great. Um, one of the I want to help you on those battles. Yeah, those no, are the budget battles we always, Chair the, Chin is always fighting for. One of the challenges that we have as a f um, field in the aging field are finding licensed clinicians who are interested and willing to work with older adults. So there is a huge workforce shortage across the country. So finding bilingual bicultural clinicians is probably one of our challenges. Uh, so I, the answer I would is have to agree. I would think we would love to have more. And more well, languages. how about expanding partnerships with organizations that already have that ability for, with the non, non for profit status? Is that something that we can expand or talk about? We are already connected to mental health provider organizations who do the hiring of the bilingual bicultural clinicians. Um, so, with the workforce shortage as great as an organization can be, we still are limited by how many professionals we have. They have to be licensed. Well, in I, order I to know be you have contracts already with already licensed non for profits that are doing that service now. I think one of the quicker ways so, to address this would be to so, increase that. So, Council Member, um, before you came in, we sort of explained the structure of the geriatric mental health program, and one of the initial criteria was it had to be. Um, an Article 31 licensed mental health clinic and also an aging service provider. So they had to have those two competencies. And naturally, they're embedded in the communities in which they serve. So they, it was the, it, the mental health um, clinic that hired the licensed professional. So, you know, they either, some of them actually may have had somebody on staff already and that they assigned to the geriatric mental health program and they did some mixing and matching. And as, as uh, Toby was saying, it is a difficult um, and a challenging um, exercise to hire competent licensed mental health workers um, in any language and in any culture. So, so that's maybe with one the of the ones reasons that are existing why that have met both of those criteria, maybe there's an opportunity here to to work at an increased pace with the groups that have already met those criteria to give them the ability to do even more case work slash management for you. So, so my KCS is a perfect example. They're the only right. Korean provider of mental health services in Queens. So to me, that would be an area that we could look to quickly expand without having to look, compete with the rest, rest of the country for clinicians that are bilingual. Right. Something and then, in that and order. They, and they're a valuable resource for sure. Um, and then I think it's really important to note that although it's only, you know, two geriatric mental health programs, very important, very successful, um, in, in a short period of time, 
the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene also services seniors as part of their general population interventions and, and senior specific uh, programs. So I think we'd like to talk a little bit about those programs as well. Well, well thank you, Chairs, for the time. And those are all noble causes, and I think we're only touching the tip of the iceberg here. I think that when we're talking about mental health and seniors and the amount of seniors per day, it's just going to continue to grow. So whatever we can do to try to stem the tide and work with that, I, I fully support. Thank you, both chairs. Uh, Council Member Holden. Thank you, Chairs, and thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. Um, this is a topic, uh, mental health for um, seniors, is very, very close to me. Um, um, as, as a caregiver, I'm a part-time caregiver for my mom. She's 94 years old. Um, you take her to health centers a lot. They take her around. Usually the mental health part of it is always left off. My mom's battling dementia, and it's a very frustrating topic um, because they, the doctors, the caregivers, um, medical centers, they only care about her physical being, well-being. They don't really focus on the mental part. Uh, the mental health. And it's frustrating for me to try to, because they're asking her questions. She doesn't really, can't give them. Um, and you can, I can see the depression. I can see how she reacts. I can see she'll talk like, um, all my friends are gone. You know, that kind of thing. And then mm -hmm. you, you, and you want to spend time with her, but she really rejects that too. So it's very frustrating for seniors and the senior centers. I can't get her to go to the senior center anymore. Can't get her to do it. So we need more, you know, visiting the floating hospital, by the way, um, last few months, um, which they work with um, the homeless a lot, and they said th they have trouble holding on to their mental health workers. Um, and they, they'll hire them, and then they leave for a better pay. And also, their budget gets cut in the mental health area. So we need, I'm glad we're doing it in the senior centers. I'd like to see it um, get to the front lines of the emergency rooms um, more often, because we don't see that. I just had my mom in a hospital. And again, no questions on the mental health. And I tried to explain to the doctors, this is, I think, you know, it's more than just physical, that we need to focus something, you know, to help on the other side, the mental health. and. So I, I, I love this idea. Um, I would like to see all over in the, in the health area to really expand in the mental health, because we're, we're seeing that in, in, just in caring for the homeless also, uh, the cuts. So there are many resources available to you, so we'd be happy to meet with you, Council Member Holden, privately, and, and see what we can do for you and, and your, your challenges with your mom. Um, there is an, an effort um, a float which is very exciting about age-friendly um, health systems and although that's not the primary role of DIFTA there are many wonderful foundations and other areas and DOH, MH and health and hospitals working towards age-friendly health systems so that's something that uh, will be a topic in the future and it's, a, it's, it's very exciting. Uh, because I can't agree with you more, emergency rooms need to be uh, more cognizant of people's mental health issues and certainly how best to deal with seniors, both in how they care for them and how they build their physical environments in emergency rooms, so. Yeah. Um, well noted. Yeah. Do you want to add to that? I just also want to add some of the um, work that we're doing at the health department along the primary care side, there's a number of initiatives. So right now, and I mentioned it in my testimony right now, um, we are doing public health detailing to primary care practices in some select areas of high need in New York City so that they are more comfortable as primary care practitioners in screening for depression and doing treatment themselves. That's not necessarily just age specific, but lots of the uh, people that go to primary care are our older adults. We also, as I mentioned, have a program called Mental Health Service Corps where early career clinicians are placed in primary care settings and behavioral health settings, and we've got over 200 clinicians in over 200 practices right now as another way to reach people where they, they go for care, which is frequently not behavioral health but primary care. 
And in addition, with the health department, we have a program called PEARLS, which is the program to uh, encourage active and rewarding lives for seniors. Um, it's for folks who identify positive as depression. They are most likely homebound, and we offer care, short-term treatment for them in their home. And the folks that go through that program, we've screened over 8,770 people already in just two years. So it's a pretty wide uh, reaching program um, across the city, and it's a way to get people care in their homes. They do much better when they get through our program. Um, they are more likely to be less depressed, rate their health as improved, and are engaging in positive activities. So it's a another potential resource for folks as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Rose. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <laughs> I'm really concerned about um, senior citizens and, and mental health. And um, I'm really concerned about what is the entry point for senior um, citizens who are experiencing mental health episodes. Um, if, do they have to be members of, of senior centers? And if not, when and where do you actually um, interface with them? Um, how do they then access those services? So we're, we're talking about um, multiple points of entry. And certainly, you know, this is a, a very good start and one that I, th I think is successful. So they can be a member of the community and come to a senior center and participate in our Thrive New York City initiative. Um, there's also multiple points of entry and, and um, we can hand it, the mic over to the Department of Health to talk about other ways to do that. But certainly this is one way. Another way is through our case management programs um, when they do their, their assessments, their annual assessments which are quite extensive, and they can be referred um, to either a Thrive New York City mental health counselor or to um, the resources in the community because there are other mental health resources as well, and every case management program should know what those mental health resources are. Um, a part of the focus of the Thrive New York City initiative is to really to break down the stigma so people, A, through the mental health first aid, recognize the larger community, recognize when somebody has a mental health issue. And more importantly, that the senior um, gets to a point where that the mental health is destigmatized and getting help is destigmatized to the point that they would accept that help. So this, it's, they, can, they can get help um, in many ways. And maybe, you know, they may come to your office. So we know that many times that we get calls from our council members that there's this senior, that senior, where should they send them? Um, so there's, there's many places that they can go and receive that help, um, but the first point is that they know that they need help. So I'm, I'm really glad to hear you say that because um, my frustration has been um, the fact that I have a senior who has um, had multiple, many um, uh, mental health incidents. My office, I have personally gone to the emergency room. I've, um, I've called on mental health services um, and she um, is admitted to, she'll go into the emergency room and, and they will release her um, never without any um, any other services being applied and um, to the point where she's disappeared, her health has been um, impacted, um, she's now being abused in terms of her SSI is being co-opted by people who are abusing drugs and are using her, her money to get high and, and have now addicted her to um, to heroin, um, and it's it's just it's a repeat cycle. When does someone say that here's a senior who has chronically showed up at the emergency room in need of services? 
um, and isn't getting it. And, and I have personally gone and said to healthcare professionals, please don't release her, please do something, please contact her, do something. And, um, and it, it, it hasn't happened, it just took her physically, her body giving out where she had to be, you know, hospitalized. And then, you know, they released her again. I, I need to know, there, there has to be some other nexus for seniors, for people who have seniors who are, are mentally, are experiencing mental health crisis to get services um, because it's not happening. It, it really is not happening and she's just, um, I guess my most, um, I, it, it's a personal thing for me now because of the lack of services she's been able to get, but she's not um, unique. I have other people who have not been able to get the services. So, um, and she doesn't go to a senior center. And, and she would not, so the, help me with this because I am really frustrated that this senior, and, and she has now subsequently lost her apartment because she's been in this um, emergent state since June. So she has now lost her apartment. She, um, and, and she now has physical ailments, ailments as well as now she's dealing with opioid um, abuse. So it sounds like a very, very challenging situation and, and, uh, and, and we hear you on that. Very frustrating, very challenging. Individually, I, we'd be happy to take offline some other thoughts. Um, for the group though, someone like this sounds like she needs connection to a health home, which is someone that might be able to help navigate and coordinate her care, um, but also, Flagged somewhere in the system, yeah, no, I, something I, should have flagged that should, she needed this this more point. than to, you know, take the emergent situation, care for it, and put her back out in the street. Right, I agree with you. And so, if these situations are coming up and you don't know where else to turn, please let us know so we can help navigate and negotiate with you and help connect the people you're seeing to the services that are there when there are services there. So we do have health homes, we do have programs, we do have a single point of access where we can get, if somebody doesn't access, can't access a health home, they don't have Medicaid, we can get them non-Medicaid care coordination um, because somebody does need to help take some responsibility here. I agree, it sounds like um, lots of missed opportunities with this particular person. So we'd be happy to talk offline about Thank you. other ideas. Have you noticed um, an increase in seniors who are battling um, with the opioid epidemic. Have you seen an uptick in seniors who are, are battling um, opioid addiction? And have those numbers increased? And um, are there special specialized services to help um, work with them? So overdose is a concern among older New Yorkers. Um, as you know, older New Yorkers not only have chronic medical issues, they take prescribed medications, they're more sensitive to the effects of drugs, so they are more likely to have overdoses um, if they're using other poly substances, alcohol or, or other um, pills, and are more likely to have overdose deaths as well. Um, and in particular, in 2016, among New Yorkers aged 55 to 84, heroin was the most common drug involved in overdose deaths for that group. We frequently collaborate with Department for the Aging on getting information out there to, to providers, to the community, on what to do around medications and prescriptions. Um, we've been doing work with Healing NYC and a lot of work around judicious prescribing so, so doctors aren't over-prescribing the kinds of uh, medications that contribute to somebody's overdose death. Um, so um, is there any special program for that other than uh, I appreciate the education and uh, I'm sure you're, you're telling them about naloxone on, but um, is there a special program that if someone knew of a senior that was um, abusing drugs that could be um, directed to? 
Um, there are some, some programs, but it's also the case that the general substance use treatment programs can manage the, the, the substance use of the older adults as well. But so. just not as specialized, okay. There, there are some, I don't have that in okay. front of me though. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Deutsch, questions? Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for holding this important hearing. Um, and I just want to say to you, Commissioner, um, congratulations. I'd like to say in my language, Mazel tov. And uh, I just want to say thank you for over the last four years for your, for your sensitivity, uh, for your caring, and your legacy will continue with the people you're surrounded by uh, here in the Department of Aging. And uh, I have to apologize on behalf of Paul Vallone for always asking 100 questions. 101, um, but uh, I just want to say thank you and um, uh, for everything you do. So if you have any issues in the future, you can always call on us. We'll try our best. And it's just really amazing to see how members here on the committee and members in the council always bring up their personal stories with you in the district because they know they could count on you. So thank you for everything and thank you well, and for all your, and your, all your future endeavors. Thank you too. And we're just a phone call away and as you said we help council members every single day with their pers personal issues and the issues of their constituents and we're more than happy to do that thank you thank you council member deutsch um, commissioner i i just want to go back to the one budget question about the thrive nyc the 1.3 million how is that uh can you give us a specific breakdown in terms of how much of that money um, go to the, the providers and the 25 providers and, and also all this, that, all that money goes to DOHMH and then they give it out to the providers. So I'm going to, um, get back to you with that specific information, mm -hmm. but essentially most of it goes to the provider network. Um, and we have Toby on the staff at DIFTA. So Part of her salary is covered through that. Um, how many staff on, in, in DIPTA, uh, Toby, how many staff do you have work with you on this, um, on this uh, geriatric mental health or the mental health programs? So I DIPTA? directly, pr I oversee the program. I collaborate with all of the mental health provider organizations, but at DIPTA, I'm the primary staff person responsible for this initiative. I work very closely with Jackie Berman and the rest of the DIFTA staff to support it, but I am the primary designated person for this initiative. And we also have uh, staff yeah. at the department that work on the friendly visiting program right. as well, uh, one of which is here today. Right, so we have a long-term care department at DIFTA where the friendly visiting program is lodged. So we have um, a deputy assistant commissioner that's assigned to oversee the friendly visiting program, which is a, a big piece of it and has a tremendous reach. So we've embedded it into case management and into our long-term care division so that it becomes one of the many services that we offer to our clients um, and our homebound seniors. So I think we can say that, you know, that Toby is the one um, dedicated staff person that's actually on this budget, but it really impacts us across the department. Everybody has their, their hands in it somehow, whether it's the, the evaluation and the planning office that are, are looking at um, the statistics and the assessments and gathering the information, our research department, um, the executive office, we're all committed to seeing this through and it's been a priority of this administration and we want it to be successful so it's all hands on deck. So in terms of the adding on to the, the case management program, the friendly visit, did they get additional funding to provide that component? They did. Um, that was also part of the the 1.3 million. That's they, part of the 1.3 million. They, well, they th this is the model that we used. It's it's essentially a volunteer model, and so each case management program that participated got um, funding for a volunteer coordinator. 
So that volunteer coordinator recruits the friendly visitors and we use internal resources at DIFTA to actually do the mental health first aid training and other training and subcontracting um, with another organization that trains friendly visiting. So this was a model that we piggybacked on that's already existed in the community and we got the experts to come in and train these volunteer coordinators on how best to run a friendly visiting program. So it's quite extensive and they're very well trained volunteers and we felt that the key ingredient to the success of this program was funding the case management agencies to have a dedicated person on staff that's coordinating the program and recruiting the volunteers. Um, on your friendly visiting program, um, do you have Cor statistics? I stand corrected. The DGMH is 1.3 and there's an additional 1.8 million for the, for the friendly visiting program. Okay. Wow, that's my lapse. So how many seniors that serve on the, uh, the friendly visiting program? And is there a waiting list? So the friendly visiting program, as um, the commissioner had said, that um, we've served approximately uh, five to 600 uh, older adults. Um, volunteers have uh, made more than 17,000 visits, 27,000 um, hours um, for those older adults. And just so you know, um, when looking at the data, it's really exciting. This is um, what we consider a social isolation and loneliness prevention program, and we found that over 50% reduction in social isolation and loneliness for older adults that have participated in the program, so that's quite significant and we're really excited. In addition, we are offering mental health services for those homebound older adults that could use additional care. I mean, I have, um, I have an organization in my district, Visiting Neighbors. Um, they used to get uh, funding from DIFTA. I mean, they do a wonderful uh, program working with the older adults, providing not just friendly visit, but they go with them to doctor's visit. And, um, right. and they've been, we've been supporting them with discretionary funding from the city council. Right, so the, they, are a wonderful program and one um, that I know very well and it's uh, one of these village to village models that I encourage the proliferation across the city government cannot do it all um, and they're wonderful programs like that that choose not to apply for funding when the RFP comes but they're certainly uh, welcome to do that because they want to for whatever reason uh, it's easier to have discretionary money or raise money privately so that they don't necessarily um, have to, you know, pencil in between the lines and, and they can be flexible in what they offer um, their constituents. But it's certainly a wonderful program and uh, the Aging in New York Fund was, uh, tries to periodically support them um, with a discretionary grant as well. So there, there are many um, village to village models throughout the city, and uh, I really um, commend their work that they do. But so it's not, not the same model. I mean, the friendly visit, that's why you, it's attached to the case management. Right, we had to scale agency. up, right? So. The, the, that's a small program um, in, a, in a small geographic location. We're trying to develop a model citywide. I mean, that's not the model that we used. Um, we used Dorot's model that they've done this, it's a program um, in the city that's well established and we scaled up their particular model. And we, you know, we, we developed it ourselves and just, it, it's easier to leverage an existing resource of wonderful case management programs that are throughout the city in every borough to build capacity within the case management programs to um, expand their portfolio of services that they can offer um, their clients and, and you know including home delivered meals and home care uh, this is another thing in their bag of tools and it's I think a wonderful resource thank you um, we've been joined by councilmember Diaz uh, councilman Oyella have a, a few more questions yeah 
So this, uh, f this is a question for DIFTA. Can you tell us how the mandatory trainings that are currently being provided funded? Of the mandatory trainings? Yes. I'm going to give a list of the mandatory trainings. How, how are they being funded? And how are they? How are they funded? How are they being funded? Is there part of the department's budget? It's part of the DIFTA, DIFTA budget? Yes. Okay. And can you tell us how, how the city is targeting seniors who may not necessarily be connected to senior centers, right, who, who are not connected to service? How, do, how are we doing that? So we do that uh, periodically through, um, through announcements that I do on the radio um, and also through campaigns. Some of them are public relations campaigns that we do. We recently did one for caregivers. Um, and we, we have a considerable reach um, throughout the city, but we're always looking on how we can continue to do that outreach. Do you ever, do you ever coordinate with, with NYCHA? I, I'm curious because Wagner, for example, in my district has like the largest concentration of older adults of any other public housing development. Is there any coordination between the department and the New York City Housing Authority to bring information? Um, I know once a month when so, the rent is due, they send out a mailing, right? right? Maybe so, include so we have um, 95 senior centers located in NYCHA development. So we have uh, quite an extensive reach. And those individuals, DIFTA is not the sponsor. They're community-based mm -hmm. organizations that sponsor this program. And my experience, and I can't speak exclusively for uh, you know, every single one of these uh, sponsors, but many of them have relations with their tenant organizations within the NYCHA Center, certainly relations within NYCHA management, some good, some not so good. Um, but certainly that's a part of their everyday operations is to coordinate with the tenants in their buildings. Yeah, I, I, I have noticed that there is kind of a disconnect because some of my, I have a couple of those. And yeah. mm -hmm. while the senior center staff is great, I don't have any, I'm not complaining about them. I think that they're limited in staff and so they focus on the seniors that are coming in and not necessarily the seniors that, for instance, like I have senior centers that have a senior building directly above, right? And right. they're not necessarily coordinating with the leadership in those buildings right. because they're so consumed with the, the, you know, the daily. So part of the program officers assignment and um, responsibilities is providing technical support and assistance to their sponsor agencies. And one emphasis is always on how are you doing that outreach to other, other seniors in your community, not just in the specific building where, the sen where it's located, but the community at large. So that's something that we, we emphasize a great deal and certainly when we read proposals, because they're all going to go up for RFP in a couple of years, um, how they integrate into the greater community and how they do outreach and how they have those connections is certainly a very highly weighted um, part of the proposal. I appreciate Something that. Something we look at, it's very important. Great. DOHMH, so uh, Council Member Rose brought up the, uh, the, the increased number of older adults that are fallen victim to the opioid crisis. Uh, is naloxone uh, trainings or are naloxone trainings being offered at c the local senior centers? I don't recollect having heard of any. Naloxone, yep. Um, we collaborate, so the city's distributing over 100,000 naloxone kits per year as part of Healing NYC. Um, and this year the health department collaborated with Department for the Aging to provide two opioid overdose prevention education seminars at senior centers in Brooklyn and the Bronx. And in those seminars, about 225 participants came and 133 of those took home a naloxone kit. So there has been some efforts for that specifically. Can you tell us if DOHMH has a tr uh, is, is tracking the number of older adults that are presenting to ER with mental health symptoms? We are not tracking that specific uh, bit of information. We do have surveillance um, from emergency rooms, but it's more um, focused on suicide attempts and suicidal behavior. So that's a health department surveillance function that we have. Um, but uh, and age is part of that, but again, it's not 
just age that we're collecting. We're collecting suicide-related behavior specifically. Okay. And last question. Um, do you know if uh, hospitals are required to inform patients that mental health issues may arise with the use of certain medications? I mean, side effects from medications are something that the prescriber is supposed to review with every patient. They're not just supposed to tell you the good stuff. They're also supposed to reveal to you the side effects of the medications. Do we know that that's happening you know, consistently 100% of the time? I don't know that anybody um, is able to track that. All right. Thank you. I think that in today's hearing, I mean, we've, we've heard about the need for more bilingual clinicians and um, I'm sure we also are, can use more bilingual and bicultural social workers in our daycare center, I mean, in our senior centers and all the providers, uh, organization. And also, I think that the concept of geriatric care, because I think a lot of the primary care um, doctors, physicians, they're not, foc I mean, they're, they're not focused on seniors. I mean, they're not trained that way. Um, so what is the Department of uh, Health and, and just to kind of look at how do we work towards increasing um, the personnel, the bilingual, bicultural clinician, and, and also uh, promoting more geriatric practice. Maybe we could start with health and hospital in our local uh, clinics. Um, because I, same thing with, uh, you know, Council Member Holden. I have an elderly, um, you know, mother who's 88 years old. Uh, luckily, my brother helps out uh, as caregiver. But one of the complaints I just heard from my brother recently was that, you know, the primary doctor that we take her to are not asking the right question. Um, they, they don't deal with seniors. So I, right now, I'm, I have to go find a geriatric doctor. Um, so that could, you know, provide that service. So, so we, we, we certainly can help you with that because we, you know, work very closely with a number of geriatricians. Um, and that's a, a, a problem across the country in terms of there are just not enough geriatric um, physicians. And something that, you know, there is a big push, push to um, recruit more people, medical students into the field, and we, we recently met with a, a number of um, directors of hospitals that have a geriatric program and, and you know, hearing uh, their tales of woe as well, um, but it's certainly something that, that is um, at, a, at a critical point, um, and I'm going to hand it over to the Department of Health to address this. Yep. And also nurse practitioner, I mean nurses, uh, because you require nursing services in a lot of our NORC, and, and what we're hearing back is that a lot of them cannot afford it, uh, and they're not getting uh, the, the volunteer service that they used to get from nurses that can come and visit. Uh, so that's something that we should look at as career opportunities for our young adults that are bilingual and bicultural. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the issues, the workforce issues in mental health care are really significant. Um, and that there are huge gaps. The gaps are cultural, they're linguistic, they're just workforce in general. Um, we really don't have enough uh, people entering into the behavioral health field. So with our Mental Health Service Corps program, one of the Thrive initiatives, we uh, make great concerted effort to hire um, multicultural, multilingual, early career clinicians, behavioral health clinicians, generally social workers, but we also have mental health counselors and psychologists that get hired through that program. And then they are placed ideally in settings to match the needs of the setting, of the primary care setting or the behavioral health setting. Um, so we are making great efforts to do that. And through that program, since hiring is a big um, part of what we're doing in Mental Health Service Corps, we are also in conversations and engaging other sorts of uh, community members, um, provider members that are also thinking about meeting the needs of various culturally and linguistically um, significant populations. So we are engaging in that work right now. We agree with you, it is a significant issue that needs to be addressed. And one final question, Commissioner. <laughs> On this model budget, the senior center model budget, um, 
did that model budget take into consideration uh, bilingual or uh, social worker um, to be included in the staffing of every single senior center? I would be happy to say that um, in every program that we've developed um, since I've been commissioner, that we've budgeted for as part of our modeling exercise, whether it be a new program or an existing program, enough money f to pay a well-qualified, culturally competent social worker. And that's something that I hope will be part of my legacy um, at the Department for the Aging because I am a social worker, um, a very well-trained um, and very serious social worker. I'm proud of being one, and I don't think that people should work for so little money when they have to go to school for so many years and work as hard as they do to become a professional. So that's something that um, you have my word, yes. It's part of all of our contracts and our planning and anything going into the future. I hope that that will continue. Thank you. Um, that's, a good, that's a good start. And hopefully, I think that is you it's know, a good like statement, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Now we got to work on the other part of the model budget to take care of all the meals and the, right. the meal service workers. So that's something that we have to continue to advocate uh, in uh, this year's budget. I want to thank the panel for uh, here today. And I'm really uh, looking forward to continue to work with all of you because mental health wellness for our senior, a growing population in New York City is such an important issue that we have to uh, continue to work at. Thank you. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing from our advocates and uh, the providers. So we're calling up the next panel. We have uh, Molly Kukowski from JASA, Chris Waddell from AARP, Julian Leach from Live On New York, Tara Klein from United Neighborhood Houses. Uh, you may begin. Hi, good morning. Uh, Chairpersons Ayala and Chin, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Chris Widello, and I'm the Associate State Director for AARP here in New York City. And on behalf of our uh, 800,000 members across the five boroughs, I'd like to speak today on Intro 1180. Uh, this legislation would require senior center caseworkers to receive mental health first aid training. Um, I don't think it's any secret, the aging statist statistics across the city, I don't need to uh, uh, brief you too much on those, but they're growing in case you uh, have, were not aware, um, which I know you are. Um, and we know that, um, you know, uh, with an aging population, there is a need for more supports and mental health counseling is certainly one of them and being able to um, identify when someone is in decline or has behavior that may signal a, um, a mental health related issue. Uh, depression is one example of a serious metal, medical illness that often goes unrecognized and untreated among older adults. And according to the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, it's normal for an older person to feel sad every once in a while, frustrated by health problems or financial concerns. But if it persists and interferes with daily life, it could be a sign of depression. And if left untreated and undiagnosed, depression can affect one's physical health and quality of life. The NIMH also estimates that nearly 2 million Americans aged 65 and older 
suffer from some type of depression. Furthermore, depression in older adults is a significant predictor of suicide. Comprising only 13% of the U.S. population, individuals age 65 and older account for 20% of all suicide deaths, with white males being particularly vulnerable. Suicide amongst, uh, among white males aged 85 and older is nearly six times the suicide rate in the U.S. Our, our New York City Senior Centers are an important resource in our community to help the city's older residents age. The caseworker at these facilities uh, at these facilities, they are on the front lines for recognizing mental health issues and, their, <clears throat> and with their clients and referring them to the appropriate services. Having proper up-to-date training is essential to ensuring that the over 300 caseworkers in DIFTA-funded senior centers are prepared to recognize symptoms of mental health decline or illness. AARP does believe that intro 1180 needs to be strengthened a little bit. First, it should uh, stipulate that uh, mental health training will be free and caseworkers will not incur any expenses to complete the training. Uh, secondly, the legislation should direct the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene to uh, provide additional training options specifically for senior center caseworkers and to make these trainings available throughout the five boroughs to accommodate, um, to accommodate their, their time, their schedules, and also you know, the logistics of attending one of these uh, trainings. So we do applaud the intent of this legislation to further identify mental health issues in the aging community and to ensure that senior center caseworkers receive regular trainings to do their job effectively. And we hope that this legislation can be further strengthened. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Thank you for convening today's hearing. My name is Tara Klein, and I'm a policy analyst at United Neighborhood Houses, or UNH. Uh, UNH is New York's Association of Settlement Houses. Uh, our membership includes 40 New York settlement houses, as well as two upstate affiliate members. We collectively reach 765,000 people across over uh, 680 sites throughout the city. Uh, so thank you again to Council Members Chen and Ayala for convening today's hearing, and. Uh, for your attention to the mental health challenges facing the older adult population in New York City. Uh, with the growing older adult population in New York, it's more important than ever that we focus on the mental health needs of this population. UNH supports intro 1180, which would require mental health first aid training for caseworkers, and we would like to share some implementation concerns about the legislation. We also support and appreciate the Council's Geriatric Mental Health Initiative and encourage the Council to expand the program in fiscal year 2020 to more communities. So first on uh, intro 1180, uh, again, we support the, uh, the bill by Council Member Ayala. Mem many of our member staff already received this training for the department, from the Department of Health and speak very highly of its usefulness. Refreshing the training every three years is also an important component of the bill as the mental health field evolves quickly and staff can use a refresher. Uh, while the bill is straightforward and positive, there are several factors that we think will strengthen its implementation. First, the Department of Health should continue to be flexible in where and when they offer these trainings, as my colleague just mentioned. So for example, they should provide the trainings both directly at senior centers and periodically at their own centralized office space. They should also consider an option where the training, which currently lasts eight hours, is spread out over several weeks at different times of the day uh, to provide flexibility. The training should continue being offered in English, Spanish, and Mandarin with options available for other languages upon request. Uh, again, these options will provide flexibility for staff to ensure they can easily participate in the trainings. Uh, additionally, the city needs to be cognizant to ensure the training does not detract from caseworkers' work responsibilities in any significant way. While a one-day training is not a major new work demand, leaving seniors unattended during the training could have consequences for them in the case of an emergency, like a deadline for a benefits application or a mental health crisis. So the city needs to work with senior centers just to make sure there are no such unintended consequences or costs to the program. Next, uh, UNH is a longtime supporter of the Geriatric Mental Health Initiative, and uh, we appreciate the City Council for consistently supporting the program. Uh, the Geriatric Mental Health Initiative funds mental health services in community spaces where older adults gather, like senior centers, and also supports in-home services for homebound seniors. Uh, the initiative increases the capacity of community-based organizations serving older adults to identify mental health needs, 
provide immediate mental health interventions and refer clients for further psychiatric treatment when necessary. By placing mental health services in these non-clinical settings, the initiative uh, providers are able to improve access to mental health services in the community and providers can adapt their programs to meet the needs of the community they serve without stigma. Staff within these programs are often the best resource for detecting mental health issues in seniors as they work with seniors on a regular, even daily basis. Symptoms of depression and anxiety in older adults frequently coincide with other illnesses and life events like mourning the loss of loved ones or coping with the onset of disabilities, which can cause these mental health issues to go undetected. Increasing awareness and access to services within the places that seniors frequently attend ensures that people are receiving depression and substance abuse screenings and are being connected to appropriate interventions as needed. So the City Council should ensure that at a minimum, the Geriatric Mental Health Initiative is restored at $1.9 million in the upcoming budget cycle to continue these services for older adults. We also recommend that the Council consider a higher investment to expand this crucial program to additional sites. Uh, so thank you for your time. Uh, my contact info is in the testimony for questions. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you, Councilmember Chin and Councilmember Ayala for holding this hearing. Um, my name is Juliana Leach. I'm a social work intern um, testifying on behalf of Live On New York. Uh, Live On New York represents 100 community-based organizations that serves over 300,000 older New Yorkers annually. Live on New York supports continued investment in DIFTA funded senior services and continued investments for older adult through Thrive NYC. Further, Live on New York supports the general intent of Intro 1180 and has a few recommendations to strengthen the bill. Um, but to start, I would just like to reiterate the importance of investing in mental health services for older adults. It's estimated that 20% of older people aged 55 ages 55 and older experience some type of mental health concern, one of the most prevalent being depression. Older men, particularly those over 85, have the highest suicide rate among, among any age group. According to the World Health Organization, the normal processes of aging also brings additional risk factors that can affect mental health. Um, some, of, some of these stressors experienced um, at older age are loss of capacities and independence, health concerns, reduced ability or mobility, as well as experience life events such as bereavement or changes in economic status related to retirement. The combination of all of these stressors can lead to additional distress and isolation. And notably, social isolation and loneliness has been shown in recent research to surpass obesity as an early protector of death. Um, that's why strengthening supports tar targeted specifically at older adults is critical. In fact, the recent DIFTA Senior Center evaluation showed one-third of Senior Center members who attended the center at least twice a week self-reported an improvement in their mental health after a 12-month period, and more than 66% noted that socialization and avoiding isolation was the reason for attending. Uh, as with all senior services, and particularly with compl the complexity surrounding mental health stigma and issues, it's critical that all services must include additional funding and support for culturally competent staff, both to provide outreach as well as direct services. The lack of multilingual staff and budgets for outreach into communities is an absolute barrier to accessing services and must be addressed and funded. Live on New York also recognizes the importance, important work through Fr Thrive and Rice C which has continued to build up geriatric mental health services in senior centers. We recognize other city-funded programs such as friendly visiting and mental health services for elder abuse victims, and we hope this work continues so that many more senior, service, senior centers can be served through multiple access points. Um, Live on New York thanks lead bill sponsor, Council Member Ayala, a former senior center director herself for, the introdu for intro 1180. Um, we support the intent of the bill and we offer the following two recommendations to strengthen it. The first being the training must be free of charge. As we all know, senior center budgets are very limited um, and without it being free, uh, this will be an unfunded mandate on the senior centers. And secondly, um, we must ensure training is offered often and accessible citywide, as my colleagues already mentioned. Um, the bill the reference in the bill through DOHMH is a minimum eight hour training and it has an attendee space limit, um, but nearly 300 city staff citywide would be subject to the training requirement and likely more if more than one staff per center is required to take the training. 
Uh, senior centers are already understaffed and it's unrealistic for every worker at each senior center to take the training on the same day uh, because there would be no one to run the senior center. Uh, the city must ensure additional trainings are added and published on a training schedule far in advance so centers have the flexibility to plan and, and attend. Further, the city should offer trainings on site at senior centers themselves or at the very least in the boroughs and that the training should be offered at many times during the year because new staff are, already, are added periodically. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Live on, New York, li Live on New York looks forward to working with DIFTA, the administration, city council, and our members to make New York a better place to age. Hi, good morning, Councilmember Ayala, Councilmember Chen. Thank you for today's hearing. Uh, my name is Molly Krakowski, Director of Legislative Affairs at JASA. Um, since 1976, JASA has offered geriatric mental health services in recognition that older adults have unique psychological needs. Today, JASA provides a variety of services to support older adults with behavioral health issues, helping them to lead healthier and more fulfilled lives. Among our key services is our geriatric mental health unit uh, clinic in the Bronx. The clinic provides a range of treatment options for older adults, including individual and group treatment, pharmacological therapy, in-home counseling, and assistance in um, accessing a broad range of community-based social services. <clears throat> JAS is also part of DIFTA's new initiative to bring mental health professionals into senior centers. On-site clinicians support mental health and overall well-being of participants by providing information. I'm going to give you a written copy, but I don't have it today. Um, participants by providing information, treatment, and referrals to other community-based mental health services. Participating sites include Neighborhood Shop, Casa Boricua, uh, Innovative Senior Center, JASA Bay Eden Senior Center, PSS Davidson Senior Center, and Bronx Works Morris Innovative Senior Center. JAS operates two unique programs which we call Friendship Houses in Brooklyn and the Bronx. Friendship Houses are supportive environments that welcome seniors who are recovering from mental illness. And the programs also include therapeutic, recreation, health-related services, and social activities designed to encourage positive community living. Um, Friendship Houses also provide New York State licensed adult behavioral health home and community-based services, including psychosocial uh, rehabilitation, family support and training, rehabilitation services and empowerment services and peer supports. Another exciting program JAS is engaged with is the program to encourage active, rewarding lives for seniors, also called PEARLS, it was mentioned earlier. This collaboration with Montefiore Home Care, which is funded by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, targets areas of the Bronx to reduce depression symptoms and improve the quality of life for older adults. PEARLS is an evidence-based problem-solving therapy uh, model, which uses short-term in-home sessions focused on behavioral techniques to empower individuals to take action and make lasting changes. Um, for today's hearing, JASA welcomes Intro 1180, um, which would require caseworkers providing services at senior centers to complete mental health first aid training course for older adults, um, which is offered by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Staff would also be required to attend refresher courses every three years. Um, senior center staff are in many ways the frontline workers with a range of uh, issues impacting older adults, including mental health concerns. Many staff members feel unprepared to deal with the situations they're confronted with and would welcome an opportunity for additional training. In fact, JAS is hosting a full day training on mental health first aid the first week in December for staff. Uh, we're anticipating a packed room. That being said, I'm just gonna basically reiterate many of the things that were already mentioned. Um, with the requirement for a training, we ask that the city also make these trainings widely available across boroughs. Um, as you're aware, the staff is very limited, as is their time. Um, they should also be as convenient as possible with the ultimate goal of increasing awareness and skills in people who are working uh, with mental health concerns. Um, additionally, if it's possible, we would encourage the city to find a way to give continuing education credits uh, for social workers who are participating. This doesn't apply to everyone, but certainly to those who have an MSW or an LMSW, uh, LCSW. Um, a 2015 New York State education law requires uh, licensed social workers to complete 36 hours of continuing education every three years. Providing credits as part of this required training would increase participation annually, and it would also allow staff to complete some of the hours that are necessary without the financial burden that often comes with continuing ed credits. And finally, we would ask the New York City Council to consider advocating, this is on a separate note, 
um, for the expansion of Medicaid coverage um, to include reimbursing mental health home visits. Um, we know that home visits are successful in reaching hard to reach individuals um, and provide a level of care that's not easily attained in a clinic setting for all clients. In-home mental health care should be treated no differently than a visiting podiatrist, and so we would encourage the city to start advocating in the state um, for that kind of coverage. Um, we thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Thank you for your, your testimony. Um, can you make sure you provide us a copy of your testimony? Yes. Okay. Um, I know that you also heard from uh, the testimony from the, the and the um, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, do you have any um, suggestion for some of the programs that they were um, talking about in terms of advocating for more resources? I know you talk about the geriatric mental health, um, making sure that we restore um, that funding because it's not baseline. So that's something that we can advocate to uh, get the administration to pick it up and really baseline it so that, that, uh, that it becomes permanent funding and not year to year. But what about some of the other um, program that uh, Difta talked about? In terms of expanding, maybe the one about expanding it to more than um, 25 center? Because Jasso runs one of the- Runs some of the ones in, in the Bronx, but yeah, I think she mentioned 25 centers. And we have 249 senior centers. I mean, I, I think that additional funding is always welcome and it will easily and very quickly be put to good use in terms of um, expanding current existing programs for mental health um, services within senior centers, but also you know, some of the other traditional or untraditional models that are out there because as was mentioned, I, I can't remember the exact numbers that were um, said in the testimony, um, but just because there's somebody in the senior center doesn't mean that everybody at the senior center who needs the services is comfortable sitting down in that setting. Um, I think it's important to have and I think it's something that um, we're obviously working with the city to do and hopefully we're able to capture some of the people who are anyway attending senior centers and are comfortable to come into a separate area and meet with a um, clinician, but we need to continue having opportunities to reach people in their homes and in other um, settings uh, that may be able to capture more of the individuals who are in need of services. Clearly, there are a lot of people in need of services. Uh, to, to your point, uh, to Molly's point about the finding the people that are not going to the senior centers, I think, uh, in, in our, at least our opinion, um, one of the shortcomings of Thrive NYC is that there's really not a specific piece that's focused on senior mental health. That it's, it, it's uh, you know, they're certainly welcome to part, to use the program, and, and but there's not a. I think it. I think it needs to be recognized in the same way that we do for uh, some of our youth programs, but also you know, for for uh, for age groups that could be, that may need the extra help and that are more, um, you know, at risk uh, given the statistics that we see that thrive, within thrive there is a, another way for uh, older adults to feel secure in accessing these services or to how we do the outreach to make sure that we're finding people that are not coming to a senior center but are certainly um, in need of uh, some type of uh, mental health counseling. Yeah, because there are a lot of seniors that are not going to our senior center and at the same time one of my issue is that the social adult daycare program that is like right now we have more of those than senior centers and definitely i don't think they're providing all these services so i think that's something that we also have to to look at to see how we can uh, make sure that the senior who do attend those programs the social adult daycare program that they are also getting these uh, mental health wellness program well, thank you very much uh, for your testimony and for being with us here today. Um, next, I'm going to call up the final panel. We might have to add a chair. Okay. Sasha Green, you are uh, a social worker. I know that. Uh, Jamil is, uh, Malik from New York City Veterans Alliance. Oh, Samuels, okay, <laughs> Samuel. Um, if I pronounce your name uh, incorrectly, please correct me later. Uh, J. J. 
Jay Luan. Oh, Joy, okay. Joy Luan from uh, Hamilton Madison House. Uh, Ju Han from uh, Asian American Federation. And also Margaret Lai from uh, Low East Side Service Center. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm bullying director of uh, yeah, Project Open started. Door Senior Center. But I think this is very important, okay. so that's why I stay. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll just add another chair. Please begin. Okay. Hi, good morning. Um, another council member. My name is Sasha Green. I'm going to sort of make this shorter because you've heard about depression <clears throat> all morning, so I'll, I'll make it a little shorter. Uh, my name is Sasha Green. I'm, I'm a geriatric social worker with 30 years' experience in the field of aging. Up until two years ago, and for the past 28 years prior to that, I was a director of retiree social services for the United Federation of Teachers way we serve is 60,000 members. I am currently working as a consultant and the director of social work for the United Federation of Teachers staff, and I also maintain a private practice. Over the years, while working in my profession, I've come to understand that depression is far more common among older adults than may be understood by the general public. It's not a matter of an older adult being difficult, which some equate with the coming of age or as a natural condition of old age. Very often is generated by the loss of spouse, family member, or close friend, isolation, or some form of elder, of elder abuse, or serious chronic health condition, which affects individuals' outlook and relationship and interaction with others. This certainly affects and degrades the quality of life in this population to the point that it can lead to suicide in affected individuals. According to the Center for Disease and Control Prevention, older adults are increased risk. 80% of older adults have at least one chronic health condition and 50% have two or more. Depression is often very subtle and difficult to detect in older population, which I think it makes it important that healthcare professionals become aware of this possibility in persons with whom they work. In my counseling with senior clients, many were eager to discuss their feelings and their situations. Others, however, were not. They masked the responses with, I'm okay, everything's fine, nothing's wrong. With some probing, I would learn they rarely left <clears throat> their homes, lost interest in previous activities or hobbies, often complained of fatigued or decreased energy beyond what one would normally expect in persons of similar age and similar circumstances. During counseling sessions, I would discover that some older victims were victims of elder abuse. And here we are not referring to simple physical abuse, but also psychological abuse, restricting outside contract, compelling control over finances. According to the Wright Center of Aging report, one in six older adults have experienced some form of elder abuse. According to the report from AARP, more than one third of people with dementia suffer some sort of psychological or physical abuse at the hands of people caring for them. So some recommendations. Healthcare professionals should be aware of the possibility of depression in persons they work with. They are not just being difficult, but in fact being depressed. In this connection, healthcare professionals should be made aware of the broad range of resources at the disposal to deal with this issue. My philosophy is a holistic approach. I know it's different, but in my practice, in the way I dealt in the United Federation of Teacher Retirees, if there was a person who was not able to leave their home, we identified that. We bring the outside services to them. As per what you just said, Councilwoman Chen, about your parent and the other council member, 
This is huge. So what I would do, what we would do, is we bring a medical team to the house, nurse practitioners, therapists, podiatrists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, the whole team comes in. And we do this for a variety of reasons. Why? We identify depression. We also deal with medical. And that's very important. We have found people who've had who are depressed just do not go out, do not see the doctor. So that's a philosophy I have, head to toe identifying the person. And Medicare pays for all of these services. And there are many more out there if a person would want to pay privately. For instance, the nurse practitioner and the doctor can take x-rays in the house and other pro professionals also <coughs> order medications, which is huge if a person is homebound and can't get out. I'll sk skip the rest of my report because it's already been discussed. Thank you so much for this presentation. I have to leave, I'm so sorry. I'll go next. Um, thank you, Chair Margaret Chin, uh, Chair Diana um, Ayala, and the Committee on Aging, and the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction for co convening <coughs> this hearing today. I'm Ju Han, Deputy Director at the Asian American Federation. Our mission is to raise the influence and well-being of the pan-Asian American community through research, policy advocacy, public awareness, and organizational development. We come to you today representing over 60 um, of our member and partner agencies that support our community through health and human services, education, economic empowerment, uh, civic participation, and social justice. We're here today to highlight the mental health needs of our Asian seniors, who are the fastest growing among the senior population in New York City. From 2000 to 2016, the Asian senior population in the city more than doubled, uh, growing faster than all the major racial and ethnic groups. There are now over 150,000 Asian seniors ages 65 and older living in New York City. What's also significant is that Asian seniors had the largest increase in poverty rates from 2000 to 2016, from 23.5% to 24.8%, which can exacerbate uh, mental health challenges faced by our community. Um, after the tragic October incident in which an Asian worker uh, stabbed, at, a, at a Queens Maternity Center stabbed three babies in herself, they, the Federation worked with the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal to highlight the need for mental health services in the Asian community. As a stabbing, de as a stabbing demonstrated, the signs of mental illness, illness are often overlooked by Asians, and even when signs are and needs are identified, there is a dearth of in-language and culturally competent services for the uh, Asian community. The fact that Asians are the only racial group for which suicide was consistently one of the top 10 leading causes of death in New York City from 1997 to 2015 only underscores this point. Also among the senior population, Asian women ages 65 and older have the highest suicide rate across all racial and ethnic groups. As the committees consider the proposed legislation, we recommend that you take into account the systemic gaps that exist um, uh, in uh, accessing mental health services for Asian seniors. <clears throat> While mental health first aid is an important first step to identifying um, Asian seniors with mental health needs, there's just not enough in language and culturally competent mental health services to serve the entire Asian community. Um, our October 2017 report titled Overcoming Challenges to mental, health to mental Health Services for Asian New Yorkers highlighted the increasing visibility of mental health needs among Asian New Yorkers, and we provided recommendations to address the major challenges impacting the Asian community, which includes increasing access to linguistically and culturally competent mental health services. We identified four major challenges to mental health services for Asian New Yorkers. The first is the scarcity of, cultural, of community education programming that's linguistically and culturally competent to build awareness and acceptance of mental health as a health concern. As mental illness is deeply stigmatized in many Asian communities and mental health care is viewed as a Western concept. Two, the shortage of linguistically and culturally competent mental health practitioners and services, which is particularly egregious in areas of specialty, such as drug or alcohol abuse, gambling addiction, domestic violence, and LGBTQ topics and concerns. Three, access to mental health, <coughs> mental health care services, as there are few entry points beyond individualized therapy, and the cost of services is a deterrent for those without mental health insurance. And four, the lack of research into the mental health needs and service models that work best for the Asian community. To address these challenges, the Federation plans to launch a program next year to enhance mental health services for the Asian community. We will take the lead on designing and implement, implementing programs based on our research, which will help to reduce stigma and other barriers to mental health services, increase awareness of the mental health needs of Asian American res residents in the city, and foster greater collaboration between formal service systems and community resources to reach these re residents. 
We asked the City Council to make an initial investment of $1 million in Pan-Asian nonprofit organizations to develop community-wide capacity for mental health services. As linguistic and cultural competency increases the utilization and effectiveness of senior services, Asian-led agencies providing services directly to Asian seniors are in the best position to use additional funding most effectively. This investment would support the following services. One, to develop a training program for Asian-led social service organizations using models of non-clinical service delivery that utilize existing services and programs. These models would utilize, would integrate mental health concepts into existing programs or services such as youth leadership programs, parenting skills workshops, and senior wellness activities. We would also incorporate culturally competent mental health first aid for uh, key touch points in the Asian communities where people seek help, such as social service frontline staff, religious leaders, primary care physicians, home care attendants, and the like. We would also create a, a network of non-clinical mental health service providers serving the Asian communities of New York City in order to share resources and knowledges about best practices and available services. We would also develop a shared database of mental health service providers. And lastly, we would provide culturally competency training for mainstream mental health service providers. This comprehensive program will aim to increase access to and the capacity of mental health services for the Asian community, and concurrently will address the needs of Asian seniors who are often the most averse to talk about mental health needs and the least likely to seek out services. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon. I apologize that I didn't have copies, although your legislative director has, uh, has copy of my testimony. Uh, thank you to Chair Chin and uh, Chair Alaya, uh, Yala, excuse me, uh, and the committee's opportunity to testify today. My name is Samuel Mollick, and I'm the Director of Policy and Legislative Advocacy for the New York City Veterans Alliance. We are a member-driven grassroots policy advocacy, community-building organization that advances veterans and their families as civic leaders. On behalf of our members and supporters, we state our strong support for requiring caseworkers providing services at senior centers to complete the mental health first aid training courses for older adults offered by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. To complete a refresher training course at least once every three years. We do, however, urge this committee, excuse me, to further include in the language of Intro 1180, referral and specialized veteran-specific training to address the fact that veterans, and especially elder veterans, are dying by suicide at nearly twice the rate of their civilian counterparts and have specific needs and in indicators requiring this focus and attention. The New York City veteran population is particularly vulnerable to suicide and substance abuse compared to their civilian counterparts. A high prevalence of substance abuse, 5.7%, and alcohol use disorders, 5.4% in older veterans, were found in the elderly veteran population, according to a recent study. And according to the United States Department of Veterans Affairs' own reporting, the suicide rate of veterans is nearly twice that of, their civilian, uh, of civilian counterparts in New York. At particular risk, as I said, is the elder population. Currently, 53% of all veterans living in New York City are over the age of 65. And the largest proportion of veteran suicides in New York are among veterans over the age of 55. At the same time, there is data available on effective ways to mitigate this crisis. Uh, specifically veteran suicide and mental wellness for the elder veteran community. In particular, it is well established that nationwide, 70% of veterans who die by suicide were not receiving VA healthcare treatment, which suggests that healthcare intervention mitigates suicide risk for elder veterans. In addition to VA healthcare, we see pro uh, programmatic approaches such as community-based surveillance and case management as proven mitigating strategies for suicide prevention. We applaud the committee for being proactive in their approach to helping mitigate this crisis. It is also well documented that effective suicide prevention training is essential for achieving and eventually maintaining a near non-existent suicide rate. For these reasons, we at the New York City Veterans Alliance urge the inclusion 
of veteran-specific language, excuse me, language reporting, referrals, and coordination, particularly with the Department of Veterans Services, prior to the passage of Intro 1180. On behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And pending any of your questions, I will still conclude my testimony. I could go next. Yes. Please. Good morning. My name is Joy Long Fasai. I'm the Assistant Executive Director of Behavioral Health at Hamilton Madison House. We are a nonprofit settlement house located in the Lower East Side. We are also the largest outpatient mental health provider for Asian Americans on the East Coast. Currently, we operate an addictions recovery program, five outpatient mental health clinics, a pros program, and a supportive housing program for individuals with severe mental health in both Manhattan and Queens. Our staff are all bilingual, and we provide services for the Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Cambodian, and Vietnamese community. In the last decade, Asian Americans continue to be the one of the fastest growing populations in the New York metropolitan area. We at Hamilton Madison House have worked to increase the capacity to this underserved population through active education, prevention projects, and providing culturally specific services. We do this because suicide is, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States and eighth among Asian Americans. Elderly Japanese, Korean, and Vietnamese women living in the United States have the highest incidence of suicide attempts in their minority group. This is a crisis that cannot be ignored. Re research shows that the majority of the older Asian Amer American seniors do not have access to mental health services during the period prior to their suicide or suicide behaviors. This is due to many cultural factors, including there's a lack of knowledge about mental health services and options due to isolation, recent immigration status, and language barriers. Two, a cultural lack of recognition of mental health problems. Three, their own attitudes towards self-worth and that they do not want to be a burden to their family members. Four, the feelings of stigma and fear, fear inherent with mental health and depression. In New York City, there's only a few psych, um, psychiatric units in public hospitals and fewer than a dozen mental health clinics that provide linguistically, linguistic services to meet the needs of the growing Asian community. In a recent study, this one on suicide attempts among Asian, um, Chinese immigrants, local PCPs were the most, most common providers for which the suicide attempts sought advice for their mental health, and yet the providers failed to provide psychoeducation and referral services. But providing vital services to these underserved populations in the tri-state area, Hamilton Madison House is often looked upon as a mental health safety net for Asian American, the Asian American community. Currently in our mental health program, the seniors are the most vulnerable, making up over 10% of our client population, but have the most severe symptoms with high risk factors, including passive suicide ideation. The seniors are often the most difficult to engage in services due to the stigma associated with seeking help and lack of cultural competent providers. Many admit to having thoughts of suicide or have attempted suicide in the past. In order to address these challenges and increase mental health services to for the older Asian community, providers like Hamilton Madison House and the Asian American Federation makes the following recommendations to the city, state, and funders. Number one, please provide funding support and investment to Asian-led and Asian-serving organizations to hire culturally competent mental health providers and train mainstream mental health providers to develop their cultural competency. Number two, support programming and collaboration that integrates mental health services through other services. Number three, increase funding research opportunities in, to obtain data and increase access for the um, Asian community. The Asian population of New York deserves better. They came to this country and specifically to this city seeking a better life for themselves and their families. I am here today to help ease the un unnecessary suffering and death of the Asian community. Yeah, uh, my name is Margaret Lai. I'm working at Lois Eye Service Center CDT program for a group of uh, serious mentally ill um, patients. Um, uh, right now we have some, uh, this morning, uh, because I got this message very late, that's why I plan not to come here. But just 30 minutes before I said I have to go because I have to voice out our need and voice out the uh, the, 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 the problem in Chinatown in our community. 
One thing is that right now we are, uh, we are facing a very difficult time with our agent, with our, my program, because <coughs> the deficit is very high, because we, um, since 19, uh, since 19, uh, nine, uh, 22, uh, 20, 2015, we have a big deficit, and gradually keep getting bigger and bigger because of the um, because of the uh, of the managed care problem, and and it's about the, the, the board member said oh maybe it's about to close, but we are doing this very very serious mental health illness pa uh, Chinese patients, they come from um, Pritmore, they come from uh, South Beach. Bellevue, uh, like I have ex give you an example, you say one, one patient, seven, uh, seven, come, uh, seven hospitalization, seven, come, seven uh, try to commit, uh, commit uh, suicide. This, this kind of serious mental patients need to uh, have help because right now we have the problem is that always focus on high function uh, patients, not low function patients. That's why, that's why we have to uh, 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 really seriously to, to, uh, to target this problem. Because right now focus on uh, day, adult day treatment program. Adult day, I, 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 every time when I hear this, I really feel <coughs> very, a lot of pain and sadness here. How come they come there for four hour service? Four hour service. Just play mahjong, and we our program serious focus on how to help them to function. We provide them different kinds of groups. We provide them individual session, help them to go through these difficulties. And how come we are going to close? We don't have enough money to support this program. I have been, I have been fighting around in the community. Saint Yapo helped us to write letters. I, feel, I really feel sorry that I hope I, at that time I really hope that yes, yes, some we will have some help. But unfortunately, from the newspaper, from the newspaper, how they respond is only less than five thousand dollars. Our deficit is fifteen thousand. This for for this is not a big amount. It's a small amount. But without this money, we will be closed. Where I am going to send them, where I am going to send them to, they are so chronic. My, I already spread the news to them. Already two patients already has hospitalized in Belleville. Why? Because they don't see any hope there. They are helpless. They are so scared. I, I'm happy to hear that so many services, so many services for, for the New York City people. How much, how much money that spend on our Chinese community? How much help that we can get? They are sad over there, very sad, and they voice out. Help us. I hope that, I hope that really this problem, mental health is in this very serious, very, very serious. We have to do something about that. Right now, this program, this book, I really, this program, all the people from, say, uh, we, we, we suggest this kind of service, this kind of service, yes. But this is the immediate services that we want help. 
I'm sorry that I, I'm crying, but I really work with my heart. And together is that I feel angry. I really felt angry and sad because the program, we work with our hearts, with our everything, but we will have a chance to close. This is, I, I can't unfair, maybe this is the, this is something will happen, but I really bring the attention to you people, right? We need help. How? Please let us know. Sorry. No, thank you. Thank you for coming to testify. Um, Chair Ayala, we will continue to see how we can help the program to continue. Unfortunately, the, the organization that runs the program do not alert us, um, but we are working with some other nonprofits to see if somehow we can save your program. Because the board, right? Try yeah, I, we, well, we, can, we can talk more about it offline because I visited that program too, and uh, we will continue to work on it to make sure that it will continue because the, the clients that you service really need your program. So thank you for being here. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, you know, I really want to share in with you how Chinese American Planning Council the provide very great, you know, services for our immigrant low income needy person. I get a sample and the uh, Chinese American Planning Council Open Door Senior Center just celebrated 46 anniversary. Only what? Identify yourself for the record. Your name and title. Oh, my name is Pauline Yang. I'm from the Chinese American Planning Council. It's the huge non perfect social service organization, not only in citywide, in the countrywide. We, I feel power of the Chinese American Planning Council, so that's why this is my first job. Last 50 years, I wish this is my last job. Why I'm thinking about the people, everyone thinking about I'm crazy. Why I joined this job for 50 years and never feel tired? Because something like this young lady said that, we should have a very good heart very good mind and very good mouth and concern the person. Good heart, if without good heart, how could you help the people? Later on, I tell you how is our good heart. Good mind, if you don't have planning, uh, plan how to get the money. I really know the department for the agent get a very tight budget. How could you provide the 1.6 million pupils age 60 and older? I read the record. Every day, they just provide service for the 300 elderly. But totally, New York City had 1.6. That means impossible because I don't want to bring on the commissioner. Commissioner is very wonderful lady. Why I come here today? Because I know today is uh, he's the last test flight. I want to meet him, uh, meet her, and say thank you to her. But the one thing may uh, us all the very important ladies up there. I'm small potato. You should listen my voice. How could, you know, you just give the very little uh, time money to the department for the agent. How could you ask them to provide wonderful 
perfect services for 1.6 elderly. So you cannot blame the department for the agent. Definitely, you cannot blame all of us. The point, my, psych, my philosophy, why I stay? Because I care of the little person. Something like open door and CPC do not get even one dime for the mental health budget. But this means we should give up level care of our mental clients now. We really, really provide very good thing. How right now I just tell you, you had a good mind, good mouth, and good heart. The mind is, even you don't have money, no excuse. No excuse. And let the needy person die in their apartment and die in the, on the street. That is our responsibility because we are the social worker. So we should care of the needy person's the daily life. Okay? Get a sample, open door. We pay the family visiting all the time. We train our volunteer, we train our staff, and go to family visiting. Even we don't have credit, even we don't have money. So that's why this one thing. The second, the happy seasoning is coming right now. A lot of our clients live alone. Live alone. They really, you know, and uh, feel suffering. This is really the season. A lot of senior commit suicides. They feel lonely. Nobody care of them. Special if they sit at home. Nobody help them. So that's why right now is very important time we should pay attention to them. Not only family visiting, and also we open our mouth and raising the money because the department for the agent give us little money. No money for the party, no money for this and that thing. But I want my senior want to get together. Invite them to come to our center for free. How I do it? I just ask the vendor, give me the food. I ask the business person and good heart person, people, give me some money. I just, you know, do a wonderful, wonderful party. Get a sample, God bless me. Get a sample last Thursday. You know, what's the weather for the last Thursday? Very serious problems. But I pay to God because Friday I had two big Thanksgiving parties. I provide more than a thousand seniors in my center because morning, the one party, afternoon, one party for free. But they are so happy. I provide the food for them. I provide the performer to them. Not only provide performer to them, I ask them to perform by themselves on the stage. So that's why I just said that money is very important. But sometimes if you don't have money or you don't have enough money, you should open your mouth and go to the rich people and ask money. So that's why the, the people scaring of me, special department for the agent, they said that when I see Pauline in, she don't know anything, just said that money, second word is money, the third word is money, 
forward at the last one is money. I just said that. No money, no talk, no money, no honey. No money, how could run the good program? Even we had a good heart, very well. But I want to use this opportunity. I feel power of CPC. We provide the great services for the needy person. So we save their life. I also just talk to my lovely, wonderful chairperson, Margaret Chair. She always find the money for the senior. She listen, had a good heart, and listen, and talk, and action. Most of things, not only listen, action is very important. So that's why I thank you, Margaret Chen, and all of you. She said that she feel, feel power of she is the city council district one. I, the CPC feel power of Margaret Chen because most of our program in the district one, her district. If no Margaret Chen, I not come here today because I know I don't have money. Yeah, I don't get even one time for the the mental health. Why I come here? I still want to use this opportunity to thank you, Margaret Chen. Uh, and thank you, department for the agent, give us very good facility and give us very good heart. My, my sister, don't cry. You should learn from me. Good heart, not only good heart, good mind also has a good mouth. Us, everyone give you money. You collect the money, you are program will could be survived. Thank you, thank you everyone. But um, I tell you, the department for the agent give me very tight budget, no money, I still do wonderful job. You do, Boeing, thank okay. you for- Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for being here. Um, they won one of the best program in my district, and in that model budget, she did not get a dime. Yeah, she was one of the, her center was one of the 26 centers that did not get any increase. But we're gonna change that this year. And the budget year, we will definitely advocate for more funding for mental health services. And working with Council Member Ayala, we're gonna work on the legislation, but at the same time, we're gonna work on more funding. So thank you for being here today. I just wanted to thank you all for being here. This has actually been uh, a subject matter that's been you know, on my mind for many, many years. Um, I, as the director of senior uh, services many moons ago, um, this was something that I faced every single day. I was a caseworker. And so it's, uh, it's pretty cool to be here today, you know, uh, standing up for other caseworkers because I know that they desperately need you know, the, the training and they need to be able to identify. But um, you know, the funding is equally as important. Um, and, I, and I recognize that even in communities like mine where we have a, a huge and continuously growing uh, Asian population, specifically you know, in the elderly population that we're not necessarily servicing them in the way that, that they deserve to be serviced. And so that is something that we will, we will con definitely uh, be considering in the next budget cycle and seeing how collectively we could, you know, we can advocate to, to address that, that void and that, that need. Thank you all for coming here today. Yeah, thank you again for being here today. Uh, the hearing is adjourned at one o'clock. Oh.